How's going guys, welcome to the channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the heir of Nazarick. Part 1. Huge shout out to Midnight Lost for this story. If you want to see awesome fanfiction like this, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get into the video. Bane Zool Gaon cursed his own curiosity as he started the seal matrix that kept him confined within the bars that was now his prison, which unfortunately for him, looked like it was located in a sewer of some sort. The Elder Lick just had to be drawn to the commotion outside of the Great Tomb of Nazarick, which was now situated deep within a massive forest, which was ironically located in the center of the massive village known as Konoha. His only company being that of the giant fox-like creature that had been attacking the village only moments ago, which was now curled up in the far corner of their cell, drained of its power temporarily as a result of the ceiling. Bemoaning the fact that he had arrogantly refused the aid of his loyal servants, that had shown great desire in accompanying him, and had even left his treasured staff within the tomb, feeling he didn't need it. With great hubris, he had thought himself untouchable. However, he had learned that the power of a literal god could very well touch him. A lesson he had learned at a great price. Though, it was probably for the best. If any had joined him on his outing, they too would have been sealed within the boy. Letting out a small sigh, the lick continued studying the sealing array. While he was no master in the strange art of seals this world had, he was knowledgeable enough to understand it. Having spent the last few years looking in on the inhabitants of the village the forest his home resided in. Namely, the village's leader and his wife, combined with his own existing knowledge with the use of magic circles. Ironic that he would also view their last moments on the mortal plane, before finding himself sealed within their own child. From what he could decipher from the sealing array, he knew there was little chance of escape. At least not any time soon. Furthermore, it appeared as if the seal was designed to siphon the chakra from the beast behind him, as well as his own power, since he too was now a prisoner within the child. As such, at the rate his power was being drained from him, he calculated that he had 9 to 10 years before he was completely drained, and then, well, it wasn't something the lick really wanted to think about right now. So, that is how it is then. He surmised with a sigh, turning away from the bars. Ironic that my own pride would be my downfall. Growing curious as to what was going on in the outside world, the skeletal mage waved his bony fingers in the air before him, summoning a large flat circle to appear before him. Focusing his magic, he viewed what appeared to be a large room filled with various individuals. On one sided, Ames recognized the heads of the various clans that called the village home. The opposite of the clan heads were a punch of pathetic and weak-looking individuals, which the overlord of Nazarick had identified as the civilian council of the village. A bunch of ignorant fools that were only concerned with stuffing their own pockets. Lastly, an elderly-looking man of below average height with a gaunt face stood at the end of the large U-shaped table, flanked by three similarly elder-looking individuals, two male and one female. Still dressed in his dark gray shinobi battle armor. His helmet sitting on the table, exposing his receding gray hairline and a similar gray goatee adorning his chin. Various wrinkles marring his aged face with some liver spots, showing the years he has seen throughout his life. In his arms, a blonde baby boy that was soundly asleep, despite the ruckus exploding around him. Council room. A multitude of voices echoed within the room, as nearly the entire council on both sides attempted to talk over one another. Emotions still high from the QB attack that had transpired not even two hours ago. While the council members argued amongst one another, Hiruzen, with a heavy heart, pondered what to do. He knew he would have to reveal the deaths of both Minato and Kishina, as much as it pained him to do so. Though his biggest dilemma was how to approach the little boy he now held in his arms. The son of both Minato and Kishina, and the new Jinchuriki of the Kayubi. In his dying breath, Minato had told the elder man that the villagers would see his son as a great hero for holding the Kayubi's wrath at bay. However, Hiruzen didn't share his predecessor's optimism. While he believed in the will of fire within the village, he also wasn't so blinded by it that he believed the populace would ignore the deaths of loved ones. Knowing all too well how pain and grief can cloud one's visions. Not to mention, revealing the boy's burden also contradicted Minato's own instructions of not revealing his parentage until it was determined the boy was ready and capable of defending himself due to both of his parents' numerous enemies. This also meant that he couldn't even reveal the boy's heritage to the council either. Meaning as far as anyone else was concerned, young Naruto would simply be an orphan from this evening's attack as much as it broke his aging heart to do so. Letting out a sigh, he turned to his former rival and gave a subtle nod as the bandaged elder strikes the floor three times with his cane, catching all the occupants' attention as they began to quiet down and settle into their seats, looking to the four elders at the end of the table expectantly. It is with a heavy heart that I inform you of the passing of both Minato Namikaze and his wife Kishina Yuzumaki, as such, I reluctantly take up the mantle once more as Hokage. 
he announced in a somber tone, earning a series of gasps from various members of the council, namely the shinobi side that had greatly respected the two. Numerous members of the civilian council silently cheered for the passing of the Yan Dai Mei, as the man was becoming a thorn in their side in the ways they had conducted their business, shrinking the power they had claimed as their own during the San De Ami's time. While some of the more vain female members of the civilian council felt a perverse sense of justice that the red-haired whore had finally gotten what she deserved for stealing Minato away from them. Bishina died due to injuries she sustained while battling the Kayubi no Yoko. Here is an explained, merging fact with fiction, knowing it would be folly to reveal that the late Uzumaki woman was the previous container of the giant fox. While Minato sacrificed himself to defend his village and his home, exemplifying what it means to carry the will of fire. And what of the Kayubi? The mummified elder man inquired, his lone eye lingering on the sleeping infant in the former Hokage's arms. How was the Yandai Mei able to defeat the demon? Here is in mentally cursed Danzo as he looked around the room, seeing that the old war hawk's words had caught everyone's curiosity, forcing the recently reinstated village leader to reveal the infant's burden to these fools. Prompting him to narrow his aging eyes at the bandaged war hawk. What are you planning, Danzo? He mentally pondered before he let out a tired sigh as he braced himself for what he was about to do. He could only hope Minato, Kishina, and even young Naruto would forgive him someday. But no other option available, Minato was forced to seal the Kayubi into an infant child, born this night. The third Hokage informed the council members with great reluctance. He had vainly hoped that he could keep the child's burden a secret from all, but Danzo had forced this revelation. This is Naruto Uzumaki, chosen by Minato himself to keep the Kayubi at bay with a burden the boy never asked for. As the elder man had expected, the room erupted into pandemonium as members of the civilian council began to demand that the child be killed to finish what the Yan Dai Mei had started. On the other side of the table, many of the clan heads kept silent as they contemplated the revelation they had been given, with the exception of one particular clan head who now narrowed her eyes dangerously at the San De Ami Hokage. We should kill the demon child now while it is weak. A far councilman from the civilian side shouted, earning a series of agreements from his fellow council members some of which even began to detail gruesome ways they could perform the child's execution, much to the disgust of the various clan heads. Especially Tsuma Yuzuka, whom was a fierce mother first and clan head second. Enough. We will not execute an innocent child. Hiruzen called out leaking out a considerable amount of killer intent, causing the entirety of the civilian council to sink into their seats while shivering in fear at the potent amount of bloodlust emitting from the reinstated village leader. And I hereby decree right now. The aging village leader continued, emitting even more killer intent than previously, causing even some of the more battle-hardened shinobi in the room to sweat under its pressure. That any who speak openly of Naruto's burden shall immediately forfeit their lives, henceforth. You can't do that. Another member of the civilian side exclaimed. We of the council do not approve of such a needless law. You forget councilman, I am the Hokage of this village. Here is in rounded on the ignorant fool, focusing his killer intent on the man. Know this, Councilman Sato, this is my village, and you are merely an advisor to me, nothing more. The now identified Sato dropped into his chair, gasping for air as he felt the full effects of the aging shinobi's killer intent focused on him. Either due to fear or intelligence, the man wisely kept his mouth shut. What shall we do with the boy then? Inquired Hiashi in a stoic manner. You should give the Jinchuriki to me, Hiruzen. Danzo calmly stated before Hiruzen could reply to the Hyuga clan head, displaying little emotion in his voice. I shall see to it personally that it receives the proper training and conditioning for the great good of Konoha. You mean so you can strip him of his emotions and turn him into a weapon loyal only to you, Danzo. The San De Ami accused his rival with narrowed eyes, prompting the Warhawk to grip his cane in irritation. Hiruzen was well aware of the fact that Danzo had ran a Black Ops Anbu unit known as Root that was used for more darker missions, not for the faint of heart that were not on the official books. While officially, Root was allegedly disbanded under Minato's orders, Hiruzen wasn't entirely convinced that Danzo had completely did so. Mainly because the old war hawk and complied with the order far too easily when the Yan Dai Mei had issued it. The Inuzuka clan will take the pup and raise it as our own. Came the voice of Tsu Inuzuka. Absolutely not. Exclaimed Fugaku, the clan head of the Ichiha clan. The Ichiha clan will not stand idle and allow your clan of flea-ridden mutts to raise that. Thing. I for one agree with the civilian council, the child must be neutralized before it becomes a threat. Hearing this, Tsum along with her canine partner, growled at the Achiha member in a threatening manner, whilst the various councilmen on the civilian side celebrated the fact that an influential member of the shinobi council had taken their side and had given weight to their words. Though they were quickly silenced by another dosage of killer intent. So what do you plan to do with the child, Hokage-sama? inquired Hiashi, head of the Hyuga clan. 
for the most part, the man was impartial to the child's burden, as he had enough to contend with at home, with his wife being eight months pregnant with their first child. As such, his clan elders were already making plans for his heir, much to Hiyashi's displeasure. Pirazin frowned slightly. He desperately wanted to allow Tsum to raise the young boy, knowing that under the Inuzuka's banner, young Naruto would be well taken care of. However, Fugaku had already made it clear that the Ichiha clan would not allow it, and since their clan made up the entirety of the Kanoha police force, it would spell non-stop trouble for him. While it was not openly stated, it was a position Fugaku could exploit if pushed. The last thing the elder village leader needed was a civil war breaking out within the village because of a single clan throwing a hissy fit. Young Naruto will be placed in an orphanage along with the other orphans from tonight. The San de Ami stated with a sigh, remembering all the lives lost this evening, before turning his attention back to the council members once more, hardening his gaze. And I remind you all, any mention of Naruto's burden is punishable by death, regardless of station. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Slowly, one by one the council members departed the room. Some of the civilian council were shooting the reinstated Hokage, a dirty glare for his decision to defend the demon child, while others were beginning to scheme various ways to circumvent the decree the San de Ami had just instated. Until, only Hiruzen, Tsum, and her partner remained in the room. Slowly getting up from her seat, Tsum slowly stalked towards the elder village leader, Kurameru just behind her. Her sharp and feral eyes locked in on the infant surprisingly still asleep in the elder man's arms. Something I can help you with, Tsum san. Hiruzen inquired as he sat down in his chair for the first time this evening, allowing the strain and weight of the evening's events to fall off his shoulders. That's Kashina's pup, isn't it? It was more of a statement than a question. I can smell her on him, as well as Minato's scent. I? I cannot say. The elder man fumblingly replied, avoiding the feral woman's eyes. Even though he knew the Inuzuka woman didn't believe him. Why? She asked. Why what? Why are you keeping his heritage a secret? Tsum inquired, earning a tired sigh from the elder man. You know better than anyone else how many enemies both Minata and Kashina have made during the Third Great Shinobi War. Hiruzen explained. Besides, Minato gave explicit instructions that Naruto-kun's heritage should remain hidden until certain conditions are met. Upon becoming a Chunin, he will be informed that Kashina is his mother and given his inheritance from her. When the boy either turns 18 or becomes Jonin, his father will be revealed to him, along with his inheritance for the boy. Then why won't you let me adopt him? The feral woman asked. You know how close Kashina and I were. Because as heartless as it sounds, I cannot risk the village falling into a civil war over a child. The San de Ami stated in a somber tone. You saw how Fugaku reacted when you first offered, and with the Ichiha clan serving as the backbone of the village's police force, it puts the village as a whole in a very delicate position. Silence hung between the two for a few seconds as Naruto stirred slightly in his sleep. Soon could see where the elder village leader was coming from, having to think of the village as a whole, instead of just the desires of a few. I can't allow you to adopt him, as much as I want to. Hiruzen said, looking to the feral woman. But, at the same time, I can't stop you from looking out for him either. Catching the elder man's implications, Soon grinned a little before looking down at the sleeping infant. Can I hold him? Smiling, Hiruzen gently placed the slumbering infant into the feral woman's arms. A feeling of relief upon knowing that someone close to the boy's parents would truly care about the boy's welfare. The old war veteran was no fool, he knew that some way or another, the council would leak the boy's status. Either through circumventing his law or by using a sacrificial pawn. The only thing he could do was prepare for the inevitable and do his best to look out for the boy. Mindscape. For the first time in a long time, the elder Lick felt disgusted. While the overlord would proudly bear his sins before all to see, the one thing he could honestly claim is that he had never targeted a child, let alone an infant only hours old. Unlike the despicable sacks of filth that made up a civilian council, whom seemed to take great pleasure in detailing the various ways they could end the infant boy's existence. Then there was the Achiha clan head. From his time observing both Minato and Kishina, the Lick had gained an immediate dislike for the man. His desire to take the mantle of Hokage from Minato, preferably from the Yandai Mei's corpse, before claiming Kishina as his own was clear from the start. Even now, Ains could see the hatred that still churned within Fugaku. Turning his attention back to the scene before him, he watched as the Inuzuka woman cradled the boy he was now sealed within. A look of adornment prominent on her face as she held the boy. Prompting Ains to feel a sense of appreciation for the woman. He knew very well that the feral woman held an almost sister-like relationship with the boy's mother. There were only two other women in the village that could rival the Inuzuka woman's friendship with the Yuzumaki woman, and that was one Makoto Ichiha and Yugao Yuzuki, Kishina's best friend with the latter being the woman's former Kenjutsu apprentice. Ainsama. 
A voice sounded in the Lick's mind, a voice the Overlord knew quite well. Is everything alright? You've been gone for hours. Everything is fine, Sebas. Ains replied after a few seconds of silence, surprised that his communication with Nazarick was still open, though he could feel its magic weakening ever so slightly. Weighing his options as he continued to watch Tsum cradle his container. If he told them that he had gotten himself sealed inside a child, he knew his servants in Nazarick would raise what was left of the village and potentially kill the child in order to free him from his binds. Both Albedo and Shaltier surely would without any hesitation. I see. Came the reply of the head butler of Nazarick. Will you be returning soon then? No. The overlord responded as he turned his attention to the ceiling array on the bars. Inform the floor guardians that I will be absent for the next few years. Ain Sama. Sebas questioned, clearly confused. Something has come up that requires my full attention. Ains replied, though in a sense it was not a lie. I entrust Nazarick to you. Very well, Ains Sama. It will be done. With that, Ains cut the communication, letting out a sigh as he did so. He trusted Sebas to carry out his final orders to perfection. He always has. You didn't tell them the truth. A deep voice rumbled from behind the lick, prompting the skeletal being to turn towards his cellmate. The only thing that would have accomplished would be getting the rest of this village destroyed along with the child we are sealed within. Ains commented. So the kid dies, so what? The fox commented apathetically. With his death, we gain our freedom, and this village will be nothing more than a scorch in the history books. So you think. So will my Pleiades think. The overlord stated before gesturing to the seal that confined them. But the way that works, aside from the boy drawing on our power, it also binds our souls to his. Meaning if he dies, we die. And if one of us were to die in here? The fox inquired in a threatening manner as it stood to its full height. Then our power surges through the child. Ains answered, unfazed by the fox's intimidating size. And should that kill the boy, then we die anyways. Hearing this, the QB merely scoffed before laying back down in its elected corner. Curling up into a ball, using its tails to cover its face. Regardless of your bluster, I know you do not wish death upon the child. The lick continued, calling the fox out on its bluff. You owe too much to Kashina to allow that to happen. Either way, the boy will need us, both of us, as he grows older. Unknown to Ains, a lone tear rolled down the giant fox's cheeks as it silently mourned the passing of its best friend, by its own hand. On the other side of the cell, the elder lick pondered what to do in the coming years. Eight years later. It had been eight years since that fateful night, and as Hiruzen had expected, someone had leaked Naruto's status as being the Jinchuriki of the QB almost immediately after the council meeting that night. Councilman Sato had been the sacrificial piece the various other council members had used and manipulated into revealing the boy's status amongst the shinobi forces within the village, and true to his word, the San Deami had the man executed in front of the entire council. Once again reiterating that such actions will be result in their execution, before reluctantly adding that the offending party's entire family would suffer the consequences as well. A move that even Hiruzen's former teammates were thrown off by. With that action alone, the elder village leader was able to ward off any future slip-ups of young Naruto's status, at least for the time being, though he knew the damage had already been done. Parents were already keeping the children away from the blonde boy, and some of the more ignorant civilians would form mobs on the boy's birthday to hunt him down in what they loved to call a fox hunt. Which had put the San Deami in a precarious position. He couldn't execute all involved, otherwise it would cripple the village's economy with the sheer about of fools involved with each year's fox hunt. So, he had settled for a personal compromise by executing the ringleaders of the mobs in front of all involved, before heavily fining those remaining and sentencing them for an extended time within the village's prison. Fortunately, this seemed to help as over the last few years, the amount of people involved with these so-called fox hunts had reduced sharply, not to mention the fines levied against the other participants had created a massive financial cushion for the boy, ensuring that young Naruto would not have to worry about money for years to come. Though, did that really make up for the years of abuse the poor child already had to endure? Letting out a sigh, the elder village leader pushed himself up off his chair and stretched his back. Having enough of the endless amount of paperwork that piled up on his desk. Moving away from his desk, Hiruzen peered out the window that overlooked the village as the sun began to set below the horizon. It's that day again. He thought grimly. A day that should bring a child cheer and joy, only brings Naruto-kun fear and pain. With another sigh, Hiruzen moved over to a pedestal that held a lone crystal sphere and channeled his chakra into the ball, focusing his mind on the lone individual he wished to check in on. Though as the image became clear, the elder man's heart sank once more as he watched a mob of civilians chase the eight-year-old boy through the streets. Nico? He called out, immediately a cat-masked Anbu with purple hair appeared behind him in a kneeling position. Secure young Narito-kun and dispose of the mob as you see fit. 
Understood, Hokage-sama. Niko stated before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Once the purple-haired Anbu departed, Hiruzen couldn't help but to feel a great swell of pity for the fools once she got there. The elder man knew how protective she was over the child, which was exactly as to why he had sent her. As it was, Niko was one of three of his Anbu he could reliably assign to watch over the boy without worry. The other two being Inu and Weasel, both of which were indisposed of at the moment, leaving only Niko. Later, Mindscape. Naruto groaned as consciousness slowly came back to him. Looking up as he regained his bearings, he realized he was in a sewer of sorts, filled with water about four to five inches deep. Letting out a sigh, the young boy pushed himself up out of the water and stood up, taking a moment to take in his surroundings. Noticing various pipes running along the walls, most of which were a dull gray color, though two stood out the most. A purplish-blue colored pipe and a fiery red colored pipe. Great, not only do they beat me up, now they are throwing me into sewers. The boy grumbled as he began to look for a way out. Come forward, boy. A voice echoed off the walls, startling the poor blonde. Wah. Bold paths lead to here, child. Came another voice. With no other option, Naruto began to follow the voice's instruction. Choosing a pathway, he followed it until he found himself in a massive room with a massive gate sealing off half of the room. Upon the bars, a large piece of paper with a kanji for seal shone prominently on display. What is this place? Naruto asked out loud to himself. This is your mind, child. Came his answer from behind the bars. Turning to the voice, the blonde let out a yelp in fright as he saw the skeletal form of Ains standing behind the bars. Who who are you and what do you want? Naruto shakily demanded, earning a small chuckle from the lick. I am Ains Gown, soon to be former overlord of the Great Tomb of Nazarek. The elder lick introduced himself. Nazarek? I know that name. The blonde mused, his eyes becoming unfocused for a moment as his mind seemed to recall memories that were not his own. Albedo, Entoma, Lupus Regina, Narbril, Shaltier, Shizu, Solution, and Yuri. I know their names and their faces, but I don't recall meeting them. That's because you are viewing my memories, child. Ains chuckled, as the boy's reaction had just proven another theory he had about the seal that kept him and the fox confined. It seems the seal that keeps my cellmate and myself confined is not only siphoning our power, but also our memories. Or mine at the very least. Wait, what do you mean your cellmate? The blonde inquired, picking up on the fact that the skeletal person before him made it know that he was not alone in his prison. Stop hiding back there for a ball and get up here. Ains commented, looking over his shoulder into seemingly a random corner of the cell. After a few seconds, movement could be heard in the darkness before a massive silhouette came into view, causing Naruto to stumble back before falling on his ass, splashing the water around. Before the boy stood the massive form of the fox that terrorized the village only eight years ago. You you're the... I am the Kayubi no Yoko. The fox boomed before the giant beast hung its head in shame. And I am the reason you are hated, kid. So, the Yandai Mei didn't kill you like we were taught. Naruto mumbled slightly as his mind was reeling from this sudden revelation. Instead, he. It is impossible to kill a biju, kid. The fox explained in a saddened tone. At best, one can only hope to restrain us. But why me? The blonde asked, clearly hurt. Why did he have to chose me? Why not someone else? Your father couldn't ask something of someone if he wasn't prepared to do the same himself. Ains stated. What? Naruto snapped his attention to the lick. My father. But Jai Jai said he didn't know my parents. Unless he was lying to me. Many secrets have been kept from you child, though none have been done so lightly. Ains explained. The Sande Ami Hokage has kept your heritage from you as per instructions from your father for your own protection, I however, am under no obligation. Can you tell about my parents, Ains Jai Jai? The blonde asked hopefully. Did they love me? Kit, your parents loved you more than life itself. The fox stated, chuckling lightly as it recalled how excited its former container was when she learned that she was pregnant. I swear, Kashina nearly drove me insane with how often she would talk about you. She had insisted that you were a boy from the start, Minato had made the mistake to suggest otherwise, and well, it did not end well for him. May as well get comfortable child, we have much to discuss to prepare you for the coming years. Ains commented, catching the boy's attention. What do you mean? I am naming you, the heir of Nazarek. It had been two years to the day that Naruto had met Ains Uwilgo and Urza, otherwise known as the QB no Yoko. Which had come to a bit of a shock to the poor boy when he had learned that the strongest and most feared of all the Biju was a female. Not that he had any problem with it, which the young boy had vehemently made clear when the vixen woman had confronted him about it. While absorbing Ains' memories, Naruto had gained a healthy respect for strong women. Especially after witnessing how some of the floor guardians dispatched their foes from Ains's own perspective. Between his two tenants, Naruto had grown by leaps and bounds over the past two years. 
while the elder Lick, whom the blonde had come to view as a grandfather figure, had taught the boy about the art of magic, runes and enchantments, as well as lessons in politics, diplomacy, and subterfuge. When Naruto had inquired about the reasoning for the latter part of his lessons, Ains had explained to him that not all battles could be won with physical confrontation, and that sometimes, it was best to take a less violent and less bloody path to achieve his goals. Another thing the soon-to-be former overlord had instructed the young blonde boy in is the teleportation spells. Mostly to help Naruto elude any mobs that would attempt to form up and trap the poor child. Aside from the teleportation spells, Ains had also made sure the boy knew the basic forms of conjuration. Allowing Naruto to have an unlimited supply of water and food, even if the selection of options left a lot to be desired for the time being. Though, that would be something that could be remedied later. Urza on the other hand had taught her young container the ins and outs of being a shinobi. Working on the boy's chakra control, ninjutsu, and genjutsu. The latter of which she excelled at due to her kitsune nature. Which was perfect for the boy, as the young blonde had taken an interest in pulling pranks on the various citizens of the village that had done him wrong. Urza had seen this as an exceptional training exercise to test the boy's stealth as well as creativity. Citing that the same tactic won't always work and that he would need to think outside the box to accomplish his goal. It had also helped considerably when the Hokage himself had learned of these pranks and had dubbed them as training exercises for the victims, citing that since they were a shinobi village, everyone that resided within its walls could be a potential victim to an enemy attack. The thought that a majority of the civilians never even considered to be a reality, assuming that only shinobi would be targeted in the event of any kind of attack. And the best part, the victims never once suspected they had fallen victim to the blonde boy they had scorned and condemned. Though the best part of Urza's tutelage was when she had instructed him how to use the shadow clone technique. An extremely versatile ability that sped up all of his training by a considerable amount thanks to a handy little detail about the technique that transferred memories back to the original once they were dispelled. The only limitations being that unless they were reinforced, they would dispel after a strong enough hit and the fact that they couldn't transfer physical results back to the original. Though muscle memory did, allowing the blonde to excel rapidly in his kunai and shuriken throwing skills. It is time. The voice of the elder Lick echoed in the back of his mind, causing the young blonde to flinch slightly. While he knew this day was coming, he was not looking forward to it. Not even a full year ago, Ains had been upfront about his mortality and had even meticulously counted down the days. Preparing Naruto for what was to come. His return to the great tomb of Nazarick. Reluctantly, the blonde nodded and stood up from his bed. After the attack on him two years ago, the elder village leader had given the boy an apartment to himself. Having learned that Naruto had been living on the streets for the better part of the year after the orphanage had kicked him out. It had been a bid to keep the boy safe and to have a place of his own in peace, though it was never to be. Ignorance still ran rampart through the civilians, and thus, they would vandalize the outside of his once nice apartment. At first, the blonde had attempted to keep it clean, though quickly learned that it was futile. Any time he would manage to remove the vandalism, the mobs would return to do even more damage to the property. So he had let it go. Extending his arm out towards a coat hanger isolated in the corner of the room, he summoned his coat to him. It was nothing too extravagant. Just a long black trench coat with dark red trimmings. Matching perfectly with his usual black shinobi pants and burnt orange sleeveless shirt. With a heavy sigh, the blonde boy focused his magic into a single point and with a mere gesture, opened a portal into the deepest parts of the forest of death. Squaring his shoulders, Naruto moved through the portal, allowing it to close behind him. Within the blink of an eye, Naruto found himself before a large entrance of a structure that reminded him of an ancient temple of some kind from a forgotten time. Here goes nothing. Naruto thought as he made his way towards the entrance of the structure. Mentally preparing himself for anything that could possibly happen. As he approached the entrance to the structure, he could see various forms of bones begin to form and reshape into humanoid skeletons, each wielding a variety of weapons. First line of defense for the Great Tomb of Nazarick, they keep weaker enemies at bay, while acting as an alarm for the floor guardians. Ains explained in the young blonde's mind. Just flare your magic, it will neutralize them without needlessly destroying them. Without acknowledging that he had heard the elder lick, Naruto pulsed his magic outwards. Causing an arcane shock wave to wash over the skeletal army, causing their bones to rattle before they fell to the ground in pieces, but not destroyed. I suppose they know I am here then. He mused out loud to himself as he continued to make his way into the massive complex. Feeling numerous high magical signatures zeroing in on his location. Knowing that the floor guardians were no doubt converging at a single point just ahead of him, the young blonde continued his trek through the massive hallway. To be honest, while he didn't show it on the outside, Naruto was extremely nervous about coming face to face with the floor guardians. From Ains's memories, the blonde knew how strong each one was. 
which had left him with a sense of awe and a healthy respect for each of their fighting prowess. After a handful of minutes of walking, Naruto found himself standing in an intersection, with 13 individuals standing before him. Standing firm, the young blonde beepies those that stood before him. Each of them, with the exception of two, wore an expression of surprise to see a mere boy standing before them. At the front of the group was an elderly-looking man dressed in an elegant and graceful manner. As expected of the head butler of the Great Tomb of Nazarek. Sibas Tian. Naruto commented, much to the shock of the elderly-looking man, before the blonde scanned over the rest of the group. Yuri Alpha, Lupus Regina Beta, Shizu Delta, Narbral Gamma, Solution Epsilon, and Intoma Vasilisa Zeta. One by one, Naruto had named off each of the Pleiades, much to each individual's shock. Even the arachnid battle maid was not immune to showing clear surprise in her body language, despite her masked face being covered. Moving on from the battle maids of Nazarek, the young blonde focused his attention on the floor guardians themselves. Though, he was concerned with how the overseer and her rival would take the news they were about to be given. Albedo. The blonde boy addressed the overseer of the floor guardians, much to the surprise of the succubus, despite her hearing the boy call out the names of each of the Pleiades. Similar to before, Naruto turned his attention to the other floor guardians. Shaltier Bloodfallen, Demiurge, Cossetus, Orabella Fiora, and Marbello Fiori. Only missing victim and Gargantua. WH who are you? Sibas managed to choke out, alarm in his piercing eyes. Forgive me for having you at a disadvantage. The blonde boy stated before giving a slight bow of respect towards the servants of Nazarek. I am Naruto Uzumaki, and I must say, it is good to see you all again and for the first time. What do you mean, to see us all again if this is the first time you have met us? Demiurge inquired, a look of suspicion evident on his face. Perhaps it would be best explained by someone else. Naruto stated, before bringing his hands together and focusing his magic outwards. As he did so, his body gained a purplish aura around it before a stream of magic pooled out into a single point. Within seconds a very familiar figure was standing before the Nazarek denizens. Bayane sama They called out in joy upon seeing the elder Lick reappear before them. It is good to see you have returned, Ain sama Siba stated as he knelt before the Lick. It is good to be back. Ains mused as he took in the sight of his loyal followers. Knowing this would be the last time he would see them. For as short as it may be. Ain sama the head butler questioned, looking uncertain. Wordlessly, Ains opened a portal to his personal pocket dimension and pulled out his fabled staff of Ains Ul gown. An intricate golden staff, entwined by seven serpents. Each with a different colored jewel being held in their mouths. Silently, the elder Lick admired the staff before turning to address his loyal servants one last time. Ten years ago, I departed to investigate a surge of power. The overlord began. And I found the source. The village Nazarek resides within was under siege by a being of extraordinary power. The villager's leader, Minato Namikaze, also known as the Hokage, was battling it. However, in order for a mortal to defeat a being of such power, he had to call upon a god to subdue the beast, at the cost of his own life. While the elder Lick explained the circumstances, Naruto took the time to watch the various reactions of the tomb's denizens. Some, like Demiurge, Sibas, and even Yuri had quickly connected the dots, casting a curious glance at the blonde boy. In the Hokage's final act to defend his home, he sealed the powerful beast into his own son, with the aid of the god he had summoned, a being known as the Shinigami in this world. He continued. As such, I too fell victim to be sealed within the boy. Hearing this, all eyes turned to Naruto, prompting the blonde to flinch slightly, despite himself. Especially with the way both Shaltier and Albedo were glaring at the boy. Let it be known now that my heir is not to be blamed for what had happened. Ain stated with finality in his voice, having seen the way the two floor guardians were looking at his current vessel. However, his final words resonated among those gathered. Ain sama what do you mean by your heir? Yuri inquired, as her eyes drifted from Naruto, back to Ains's form, earning a tired sigh from the elder Lick. My time is growing short for this world. He stated as he turned towards Naruto before grasping his staff one final time before handing it over to the boy, whom gingerly took it. As such, I have named young Naruto Uzumaki as my heir. For the last few years, I have been instructing him to take my place, and above all, to take care of all of you. As soon as the staff left his hands, his skeletal body began to slowly crumble away, much to the shock of all those present. Casually, he watched as the bone fragments from his hands began to fall away before he turned towards the tomb's denizens. It appears my time is coming to an end. Ains casually stated before once again turning to his vessel as more of his skeletal body began to dissipate. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, I have poured all of my knowledge into you. Now, it is up to you to care for the great tomb of Nazarek, and above all, those who are precious to me. I promise, Ains Jai Jai. Naruto sniffled as tears streamed down his cheeks. 
Well, the elder Lick had done all he could to prepare the boy for this inevitable day, it still didn't lessen the pain of losing someone the boy had held dear. I won't let you down. I know you won't, and I know you will do me proud. The dissolving skeletal figure chuckled lightly, turning his attention on last time to the floor guardians and pleiades that were gathered. It has been an honor to have been with you all. I now ask that you support young Naruto and help him grow into the mantle that I have placed upon him. It will be done, Ain Sama. Siba stated, holding back his own tears. With one last nod in acknowledgement, Ains's body completely dissolved into the air as the magic used to sustain his form returned to Naruto's body, leaving behind all to grieve his passing. For his part, Sibas remained stoic while both Aura and Mare wept openly at the Lick's passing. Both Abeldo and Shaltier had departed in a fit of grief with a mix of rage swirling within each of them. After a few minutes had passed, Sibas approached the newly appointed overlord and knelt before him, prompting the rest to follow suit to carry out the last request given to them by Ains. One by one, each of the floor guardians and pleiades knelt before the blonde boy, each showing their solidarity towards the new overlord. As per Ain Sama's last request, we shall do our best to support you, Naruto-sama. Siba stated. Aye. Thank you Sebison. Naruto smiled before turning to address the rest. But I would like the chance to earn all of your trust and loyalty. I've never been one to accept anything to be handed to me, as such, I would like to earn the title Ains Jai Jai had bestowed upon me. That is a very admirable trait, Naruto-sama. Yuri commented with a small smile, appreciating the boy's resolve to earn his status rather than just accepting it. A clear sign that Ains had chosen well. What of Albedo and Shaltier? Demiurge inquired. Both are extremely hurt with Ains-sama's passing. Sibas pointed out. No doubt, blaming you, Naruto-sama. Yuri added, prompting the blonde to nod in understanding. I will go and talk with them individually. Naruto stated, much to the surprise of those still present. But, what if they? Aura attempted to ask. Then I will allow them to take out their anger until they are calm enough to talk. The blonde interrupted. I promised Ains Jai Jai I would look out for all of you, and that is what I intend to do. Without waiting for a reply, Naruto turned and teleported on the spot towards the closest room of the two grieving floor guardians, which happened to be Albedo. From Ains's memories, Naruto knew quite well of the succubus's temper, as well as her battle prowess. There was a reason she was the overseer of the floor guardians. Meanwhile, the remaining floor guardians and pleiades stared at the now empty spot the boy had just occupied. Some musing thoughtfully at the boy's actions, while others looked concerned. None more so than the two dark elf twins. Who do you think Naruto-sama will be alright? Mare inquired out loud, concern laced in his voice. I believe Naruto-sama will be fine. Demiurge spoke up with a slight chuckle. I can see that the boy has the potential to match Ain sama if not surpass him. The years to come shall prove interesting. Indeed. Siba stated with a thoughtful grunt. For now, let us return to our duties and await for Naruto-sama's orders. Hi. Each acknowledged before separating to their own designated areas, leaving the head butler to himself. So this is what you meant that night, ten years ago. He mused, recalling his final communication with the elder Lick. You knew there was no escape but didn't want us to worry. Still, you faced it head-on. Even preparing the young boy to take your mantle. But Naruto. In a flash, the young blonde appeared at a large purple-colored door. Taking a moment, he looked to the staff that was still within his hands, before depositing it in the pocket dimension, having a feeling that if he kept it with him, it would only serve as a greater reminder of the Elder Lick's passing. Even more so than himself. Knowing that it would be futile to knock and request entry, the blonde sighed and reluctantly opened the door and stepped in. Preparing himself to be met with the wrath of an angry succubus. The first thing Naruto noticed was the mess the room was in currently. Banners had been torn down from the walls and ripped to shreds, whilst various furniture pieces had been overturned and some even broken beyond normal means of repair. Though what concerned the blonde the most was seeing a pile of freshly torn in half plushies and body pillows of Ains himself. Maybe I should have spoken with Shaltier first. He silently mused, though didn't have any further time to ponder as he caught a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring at him from the corner of the room. What are you doing here? Albedo growled out, glaring at the blonde that had intruded upon her sanctum. I was concerned about you. Naruto replied, not moving from his position. As soon as those words left his mouth, Albedo exploded from her corner and tackled the young blonde with so much force that the two collided with the wall on the other side of the massive room, earning a small grunt from the young blonde. Leaving Naruto halfway buried into it. You. She seethed. You took him away from me. Naruto said nothing as he allowed the succubus to vent her anger out as she pounded on his chest with closed fists. Though the power that should have been there was absent. Why? She cried out as she brought her bald fists down onto his chest. Why did he have to go? 
Wordlessly, Naruto wrapped his arms around her crying form to offer what comfort he could to the grieving succubus. Bane's Jai Jai used to tell me stories of his time with all of you. He spoke softly, catching the sobbing woman's attention as he gently rubbed her upper back in a comforting manner. But you know, he spoke the most about you and Sheltier. Hearing this, the trembling succubus took the chance to gaze up at the young boy's cerulean blue eyes that seemed to glow in the shadows due to the magic coursing through his body. Peering into his blue eyes, Albedo could only see kindness, admiration, and concern. There was also a touch of restrained power as well, lingering behind those blue pools, making the succubus realize that the boy had allowed her to beat him into the wall. A revelation that shook her to her core. I. She began. You know, he may not have been able to convey it. Naruto smiled. But I could tell that he loved you both dearly. He. Loved me. Albedo stammered out, looking to the blonde for confirmation, in which Naruto could only smile and nod. I'll be honest with you, Albedo-chan. Naruto began, as he allowed himself to slide down the wall to get into a more comfortable position. When I had finally learned that Ains Jai Jai was separated from all of you, I almost tore off the seal from their prison myself. Even though it would have cost me my own life. Why? Albedo inquired, looking to the blonde boy in confusion, wondering why someone so young would sacrifice their life in such a way. Because of the event that happened 10 years ago, I am not well liked within the village. The blonde boy began, with a somber tone that did not match his age. For the past five years, I have been hunted down, beaten, and tortured by the villagers. To be honest, I don't really have many that would miss me if I were gone. Not like Ains Jai Jai had all of you, so if my life would reunite him with all of you, I felt it would have been worth it. For her part, Albedo could only gawk at the blonde. To learn that not only had the boy, the heir chosen by Ains himself, had offered to sacrifice his own life to free the Elder Lick from his prison, but to also learn that he had suffered greatly at the hands of the villagers of his own home village. But Ains Jai Jai wouldn't let me. Nor my other tenant. Naruto continued, with a slight chuckle as his remaining tenant was grumbling in the back of his mind about the boy's reckless offer. As much as he wanted to return to you all, he knew that if I broke the seal without the key, it would not only kill me, but also take him and my other tenant along with me. Since the Shinigami designed the seal to link all of our souls together. So instead of working on a way to safely break the seal, Ains Jai Jai focused on training me instead. To carry forth his will, and above all, to take care of all of you. Why do you call Ains Sama, Jai Jai? As much as it would hurt the old man to admit it out loud, I saw Ains Jai Jai more as my grandfather figure than old man Hokage himself. The blonde replied with a caring smile, turning his gaze towards her. Know this, I am not, nor will I ever try to take Ains Jai Jai's place, no one can. As I told the others, I will earn all of your trust and loyalty. I. Albedo moved to speak, only to be shushed by the blonde overlord, whom had now coerced her head to lay upon his shoulder, as he combed his fingers through her hair in a comforting manner, eliciting a sigh of contentment from the succubus. After a few minutes had passed, Naruto had noticed that Alebdo's breathing had become more soft and relaxed. Indicating that she had fallen asleep in his arms. With a soft smile, he gently lifted her sleeping form with ease, despite his current small frame. Summoning forth a seal-less shadow clone to clear off her bed, allowing him to lay her down upon it so that she could rest. That went well. Naruto mused to himself as he dismissed his clone. I hope the talk with Sheltier will go as smoothly. If only he knew how wrong he would be. Naruto-sama. A soft yet authoritative voice sounded from behind the door to his large bedroom. It's time to wake up. Unknown to the maid that had just delivered his wake-up call for the morning, the teenage overlord had already been awake for the past hour. Why was he still in bed then? Because of a very familiar weight lying on his chest in the form of one Ora Bella Fiora. The young dark elf girl had taken to crawling into his bed a little over two and a half years ago, feigning having a nightmare. Something the young blonde had seen through, but had kept quiet about it. He had surmised that the young dark elf was drawn to his warm empathy, something Ains regrettably was unable to offer. This caused Naruto to frown slightly at the thought. The elder Lick had held much love for those around him, though was never able to convey it in a proper manner. The young overlord couldn't think of a worse kind of hell. MMM, good morning Naruto-sama. Spoke the groggy form of the young dark elf as she sat up, rubbing her eye to get the sleep out of it. Her blonde hair having grown out slightly over the past three years, reaching her shoulders. Giving the tomboy a slightly more feminine appearance. Her blouse hanging loosely off her right shoulder, allowing the blonde teen to get a good eyeful of her smooth and delicate skin. It didn't help matters when he had noticed the lack of undergarments a woman would normally wear, causing the poor boy to blush slightly. You did it again, Ora-chan. The young overlord lightly chastised, prompting the dark elf woman to rub the back of her head in embarrassment. Well, there was this giant monster. She began to spin an elaborate tale of some fearsome creature chasing after her. 
Orichand, you battle and tame larger beasts more ferocious than anything you could dream up. Naruto pointed out. What's the real reason you keep climbing into bed with me? Well, she began, blushing in embarrassment. You have the same powerful aura as Ain Sama did, but you're also warm and have a comforting presence when you walk in the room. Something Ain Sama never had. His aura was always cold and foreboding. So I was correct. Naruto frowned slightly. My power reminds her of Ain's Jai Jai, but because I still have my humanity, she feels comforted when I am near. Makes sense. You do know every time you do this, the others get jealous, right? Naruto inquired with a small sigh, not looking forward to handling the explosive reactions from both Albedo and Shaltier, when the two would no doubt hear that Aura had once again climbed into his bed in the middle of the night. Despite himself, the blonde overlord couldn't help but chuckle at his luck. Though whether it was good or bad luck was still up for debate. Aura only giggled in response before leaning over and giving a small peck on the blonde's cheek, before slipping off the bed and hurrying out of the room, leaving the blonde alone with his thoughts and a particular morning problem that most boys his age suffered from. With a heavy sigh, Naruto kicked the sheets off of him and got up to prepare to go about his day. Ever since that day three years ago, the newly appointed overlord had resided within the great tomb, taking over the room that had once belonged to his predecessor and grandfather figure. Using the apartment that the Hokage had given him as a decoy for any wanted heroes looking to avenge the Yondaimei. Fools. Naruto thought. I wonder how they will react when they learn the truth and realize they've been targeting their beloved hero's own son. Considering how arrogant they are, they will no doubt try and deny it. A melodious voice echoed through his mind. Even if the proof is right before their eyes. Morning Urza Chan. The blonde greeted his tenant as he began his morning routine. The elf girl was in here again, wasn't she? The kitsune woman accused with a chuckle, though she already knew the answer. Ignoring his tenant's rhetorical question, Naruto proceeded with his morning light workout and stretches before entering his private bathroom to clean up before breakfast was served. Knowing that Pistanya would give him an earful if he showed up without being properly washed up. He had made the mistake once shortly after he moved into the tomb, and the homunculus woman had laid into him something fierce. Finishing up his business, the blonde overlord quickly dressed in his usual attire before departing his bedroom. As he made his way down the large corridor that led to the dining area, he was greeted by the sight of a penguin with blonde hair curled at either side of his head, barking orders at a line of maids. Each of which were sporting a blush on their cheeks as the young teen approached them. Ah, good morning Naruto-sama. The penguin exclaimed, prompting the maids to give their own greetings. Good morning Eclair. Naruto returned the greeting. Keep the tomb clean as usual, I see. Absolutely, Naruto-sama. Eclair proudly declared. No one can clean better than me. You can even lick the toilet bowl after I have cleaned it. Yeah, I'll just take your word for it. The blonde replied, not at all finding the idea of licking a toilet bowl appealing in the slightest. Keep up the good work. But I will. Tuckling to himself at the assistant butler's enthusiasm, the blonde teen continued on his way, arriving at his destination after a few more minutes of walking through the massive complex. Upon entering the dining room, the aroma of tantalizing food assaulted his nostrils. Many of the floor guardians having already gathered for their morning meal. As usual, Pistanya chan has gone all out for breakfast. He commented to himself, earning a mental nod of agreement from Urza. Ah, good morning Naruto-sama, woof. The dog-headed woman greeted. Morning, Pistanya chan The blonde overlord greeted the head maid. You've really outdone yourself this time. Your compliment is most appreciated, Naruto-sama. Woof. Nodding to the head maid, Naruto proceeded to his place at the dining table at the very end. Giving each of the floor guardians a morning greeting as he passed them. During the last three years, the young blonde had not only learned a lot about them as individuals, but also from them as well. First and foremost, Demiurge had instructed the young overlord in additional forms of strategies, as well as buffing and summoning arts magic. Not to mention an in-depth course of torture and interrogation when the archdevil had learned of the young blonde's plan to become a shinobi for the village the great tomb resided in. Citing that such skills would be a great benefit for his chosen profession. Asidus had trained the boy with every weapon that was stored within the tomb's armory, to such an extent that any of the weapons masters within the village, or even the elemental nations, would be green with envy. While Naruto still had a ways to go to fully master the art of weapons, he could no doubt give even the best a run for their money. Tsiba's Tian, the head butler of Nazarick, had elevated his knowledge in close-quartered combat. Utilizing a training regiment that would even make the renowned Mike Guy, the green beast of Kanoha Bok, much to the young overlord dismay. Though the benefit had greatly outweighed the pain and suffering he had to endure during his training. Shizu Delta had helped in refining his skill with projectiles and other range-based weaponry, to the point that the young blonde had to purposely try to miss his intended targets. 
Maribelo Fiori, the younger twin brother of Aura, had helped in his understanding and practice of the Druid arts. From being able to move the earth and vegetation to his will, to summoning forth cataclysmic abilities, such as volcanoes and other such destructive forces. Albedo, the sensual succubus, had instructed him on the importance of a good defense, as well as management and communication skills. When she wasn't trying to smoother him in her bountiful chest that is. After his heart-to-heart -heart talk with her, it seemed as if the succubus had developed an obsession with him, similar to how she felt towards Ains. Plushies and body pillows as well, making the blonde overlord curious if she handcrafted them all herself, or if she had somehow found a place to mass order them from. Shaltier Bloodfallen, Nazarick's resident true vampire, had taken to teaching him further in various magic arts and other forms of melee combat. After she had thoroughly trounced him upon his attempt to sit down and talk with her like he had with Albedo. Though he would never tell her that he had allowed her to dominate their fight. Not to say he wasn't hurting well after the fact from the beating he had received, but due to his tenacity and determination, he had managed to win her over. At least enough to give him a chance. Though now, the young overlord was beginning to think he had done a bit too well of a job in winning her over. As her rivalry with Albedo had been reignited all over again. Next was none other than Aura Bella Fiora, his now self-proclaimed bed partner, as weird as that sounded. The young dark elf, at least by elf standards, had tutored him about the ins and outs of various beasts that she had battled, caught, and tamed from the forest of death. How they thought, how they moved, and so forth. You little dark elf hussy. A voice shrieked from across the room, alerting the current occupants of the arrival of a now enraged succubus, pointing an accusing finger towards Aura. How dare you soil Naruto-sama's bed with your presence again. And the unofficial third member of the rivalry to be his head wife, as Albedo had once put it. You're just jealous that Naruto-sama won't invite you into his bed. The young dark elf shot back at the succubus in a smug manner. Which had only served to infuriate Albedo even further. Technically, she invited herself. Naruto mentally corrected the beast master as he attempted to focus on his breakfast, rather than the spectacle that was unfolding between the soon-to-be three women, as he spied Shaltier entering the room. If Naruto-sama is going to invite anyone into his bed, it shall be I. The vampire stated with a smirk as she approached her two rivals. You will need to stop using padding before he even considers inviting you into bed. Aura replied cheekily to the vampire, prompting Shaltier to scowl at the young dark elf, whom of course was snickering at the crimson-eyed woman's embarrassment. Yo you have no room to talk. Shaltier shot back, blushing furiously. You've got nothing but a boy chest. Maybe. Aura shrugged in an uncaring manner. But since I am only 76 years old, so I can still develop, whereas you are permanently stuck with those bug bites. Perhaps I shall join Naruto-sama in bed tonight. Albedo declared as she glared at the two in front of her. I shall show him the pleasures and curves of a real woman. You, the pure maiden, are going to show Naruto-sama the pleasures of a woman. Shaltier inquired with an incredulous look, while poking fun at the succubus lack of hands-on experience. Do you even know which hole to put it in? She'll probably put it in the wrong hole. Aura giggled, missing the smirk on the succubus's lips. There's no such thing as the wrong hole when it's with someone you love. She commented with a smirk of her own, prompting both petite girls to come to an abrupt silence, unsure as to how to respond. Meanwhile, Naruto nearly choked on his food upon hearing the succubus's retort. A healthy blush forming along his cheeks. Ah, Naruto-sama. Demiurge greeted as he approached the young blonde, completely unfazed by the argument of the three women. I see things are lively this morning. I take it Aura had accompanied you in bed once again. Don't say it like that. The blonde snapped with a small glare, causing the archdevil to chuckle slightly at the young overlord's plight. I must say, it is nice to see both Albedo and Shaltier back to their normal selves. Demiurge commented. Though surprising to see Aura engaging in their rivalry as well. Things truly are interesting with you around, Naruto-sama. At this, Naruto softened his glare a little before turning his attention back to the three women still arguing with one another. A soft smile forming on his lips, nodding in agreement. I am glad to see both Albedo-chan and Shaltier-chan move past their grief after Ains Jai Jai passed on. So, what are your plans for today, Naruto-sama? Demiurge asked, turning his attention to the blonde before him. Aside from wasting half my day in the academy. The blonde scoffed, wishing that he didn't have to suffer sitting through the academy just to become a shinobi for the village. I plan to visit soon this afternoon. Ah, the Inuzuka clan matriarch if I recall. Yes, from Ains's memories, I know that she had attempted to adopt me after that incident on the night of my birth. Naruto stated. I also know that she had her clansmen look out for me as much as they could before I came here. Do you plan to bring her here? No. The blonde shook his head in a negative gesture, knowing that it was too early to start inviting random people into the tomb. 
However, speaking of Nazarick, I need to schedule a meeting with the Fire Daimyo at some point in the next few weeks. About your plan to have Nazarick registered as a clan within the village. Demiurge inquired. It will give us more political support within the village. The young overlord explained. As both yourself and Ains Jai Jai had taught me, politics can be a powerful weapon when used properly. And you were a wonderful student. The archdevil complimented. So I take it if you are ready to plan a meeting with the fire daimyo, you have a plan in place. Yes. The blonde nodded. Sebason will act as the current clan head when we meet with the fire daimyo, if that is alright with you. It will be an honor, Naruto-sama. Sebas replied from his position just to the left of where Naruto sat. So, you plan to exclude the village leader from this meeting. Naruto merely nodded in response. As much as he trusted the old man, he knew the Hokage would ask too many questions as to how Sebas knew of himself and the reasoning behind naming him the heir of a clan seemingly out of the blue. No, it would be best to simply have it approved by the fire daimyo himself. Though he knew he would have to come up with something to tell the old man to allay his concerns. We'll discuss this later this evening. The blonde overlord stated as he pushed himself up from the table, having finished his breakfast. As for now, I need to get to the academy. Don't want to miss any of Iruka's boring lectures. Bidding everyone farewell, Naruto opened the portal that would take him to his assigned apartment so that he could begin his day as just a civilian teen within the village. Hokage's office, some time later. Hiruzen let out a tired sigh as he overlooked the growing stack of papers that were beginning to pile on his desk most of which were all useless proposals made by various members of the civilian council, still he had to read over every single one of them before he approved, or most likely, rejected the proposals. Never know when the collective group of idiots would actually come up with a good idea that didn't involve them trying to line their pockets for their own gain. Though, as he had expected, almost a quarter of the proposals were in regards to Naruto, and having said boy removed from the academy under false concerns over the safety of the other students. While others questioned the workings of the seal and moved to have the boy removed from the village entirely, in case the seal failed. But the low growl, the elder village leader had taken note of the names on the proposals in question and dispatched a small team of Anbu to bring them in for some one-on-one -on -one sessions with Ibiki. Looks like I am going to need to fill some more seats on the council again. He thought to himself. Speaking of Naruto-kun, I wonder how he is doing. It's been a while since I had last sat and spoke with him. With the blonde in mind, Hiruzen pulled out a spherical object that was stowed away in the lower drawer of his desk and placed it on the top. Channeling his chakra into it, he waited for the image to clear. Once it did, the elder man was greeted with the sight of the young blonde teen looking extremely bored, no doubt due to Aruka's lectures of the village's rich history, causing the Hokage to chuckle slightly. As he checked in on his surrogate grandson, Hiruzen noted key changes in the boy. First and foremost is his attire. Gone was the orange jumpsuit he had once loved as a child, replaced now with an entirely new outfit. The young teen's new outfit consisted of a pair of black anbu pants with multiple pockets and a dark blue mesh sleeveless shirt, which was usually covered by the dark purple robe-like coat with red trimmings that the young blonde wore almost all the time. To finish the ensemble was a simple pair of black combat boots, a rare piece of attire for aspiring shinobi, due to how heavy they were. Though what was peculiar to the elderly man was the seven rings the boy now wore on each of his fingers. Four on his right hand, three of which were blue while the one located on his ring finger was red. On his left hand was three. Two of which were blue, while the one located on his middle finger was a greenish color. I wonder where he got those from? Hiruzen mused with a curious expression. Though his expression slowly turned to a frown, noting that such luxurious items would no doubt draw unwanted attention to the boy. And no doubt with the young man's status, accusations of him stealing the items in question were bound to pop up. Feeling that he had intruded upon his surrogate grandson's privacy enough, the elderly man removed his chakra from the sphere and returned it back to the drawer it was stored in. Still, I should set aside some time to visit the boy in person. He mused out loud as he settled into his ongoing fight with the ever-growing paperwork that was the bane of every Kage's existence. Perhaps I can get him to open up about his change in appearance. Perhaps this afternoon. He stated before looking up from his desk, only to see that the stacks of paper had seemingly doubled, causing the elderly man to do a double take. Or not. Later that afternoon. The blonde overlord let out a small sigh as he made his way down the village streets. A little frustrated that he had been held after class due to Mizuki accusing him of cheating, prompting Aruka to hold him after class to investigate his partner's claim, which of course after nearly two hours of deliberating, Aruka could find no proof of any cheating whatsoever. Meanwhile, the silver-haired instructor had quickly departed the academy grounds. No doubt to try and set up an ambush for me again at my supposed apartment. Naruto chuckled to himself, earning an amused chuckle from Urza. 
it was no secret that the silver-haired Chunin absolutely despised the young overlord, no doubt due to his tenant. Not that it bothered him any. In the past three years, he had acquired a family of sorts that cared for him, and in the cases of a few, absolutely loved him, sometimes bordering on being obsessed with him. So what did he care if the villagers hated him for something beyond his control, he now had the family he had always desired when he was younger. Too bad those fools are only wasting their time waiting for you. Urza put in with a slight snicker as she projected an image of Mizuki and a group of nameless individuals, all gathering in an empty and run-down apartment. Wonder if Intoma-chan would allow me to use one of her insects to keep watch one of these times. He mused, knowing full well that this wouldn't be the last time a group of fools tried to set up an ambush at his registered apartment. Knowing how literally all the girls in the tomb feel about you, the Kitsune woman teased. She would no doubt jump at the chance to move ahead in the ranks, so to speak. Yeah, I know. The blonde lamented with a sigh. While the main competitors were Albedo, Shaltier, and Aura, nearly all of the female inhabitants of Nazarick were drawn to him. He had surmised it had something to do with the fact that not only did he have Ain's powerful aura, but he still had his humanity. Allowing him to express affection more openly. Speaking of which, I wonder how all of them will react when your plan to establish Nazarick as an official clan within the village comes to fruition. Urza commented with a mischievous grin. After all, you will be the only official male of the clan. Naruto couldn't help but groan at what his tenant was referring to. No doubt when he would officially be registered as the heir of Nazarick within the village's database, he would automatically be eligible for the Clan Restoration Act. Something that would no doubt infuriate various members of the Civilian Council, as well as the three old fools on the Elder Council. Fortunately, with the way he had it all planned, the governing body of the village would have no say in the matter, as he fully expected the Fire Daimyo himself to approve it, once he bared witness to the riches and power Nazarick had to offer. A small price to pay for more political power. However, his musing was cut short as he heard a small commotion in the alleyway just ahead of him. At yours hands off me, bastard. A voice lured, followed by the sound of multiple grunts. Clear indications of someone being struck. Quickly rounding the corner, the young overlord was greeted with the sight of a lone woman that was dressed in a fitted mesh bodysuit that ran from her neck to her thighs, covered by a tan trench coat and a dark orange skirt, surrounded by three men, clearly of Chunin rank. Now don't be like that Enko-chan. One of them snickered as he approached her, forcing her to stumble backwards on unsteady legs. We just want to have a little fun is all. You should feel privileged that we even thought you worth our time, snake whore. Another sneered. Now, how about you play nice? The final man commented. Hell, you may even enjoy this. Like hell I will. The woman now identified as Anko bit back, forcing herself forward and delivering a crushing blow to the first man's face, instantly breaking his nose. Though due to her unbalanced state, she found herself falling to the ground. Fucking bitch. The man cursed as blood poured from his shattered nose, before turning and delivering a strong kick to her midsection, causing her to cry out in pain, as she was forced to roll away from her assailants, coming to a stop just in front of the young blonde. Who the hell are you? One of the men demanded as he took notice of the new arrival. I don't give my name to dead men. Naruto retorted, as his left eye erupted with a red flame of power. Shit, it's just the QP brat. Another stated, recognizing the blonde teen. Just kill him, then we can have our fun with the snake bitch. Grasp heart. Naruto stated in a cold tone as he extended his right arm towards the one that had just spoke and made a gripping motion. As he did so, a ghost-like appearance of a human heart could be seen in his hand before it exploded in his grip, causing the man he had targeted to cry out in pain before crumbling to the floor. The remaining two were not given a chance to process what had just happened as Naruto disappeared from his spot and within the blink of an eye was in front of his second victim as he beeped his fist back and delivered a punch so devastating it caused the poor man's head to explode in a shower of blood, bone, and brain matter. Quickly repeating the same process with the remaining man before turning his attention back to the prone woman who was still laying on the ground. Slowly making his over to her, he could see her beginning to slip in and out of consciousness. Knowing he couldn't in good conscience leave her here, he moved to pick her up, only for her to weakly fight back against his touch, though she had no strength left, as whatever she was inebriated with had begun to take full effect on her. But little effort, he gently secured his hands and picked her up in a bridal position. The last thing Anko saw before darkness finally claimed her was a pair of blue eyes and three whisker marks on each cheek. Ah, bringing women home already Naruto-kun. Such a stud, you are. Hers it teased. Not now. The blonde retorted as he rolled his eyes at the Kitsune woman's antics before opening a portal to take him and the now unconscious Anko back to Nazarick. Damn, going to have to catch Tsum-san another time. Anko Midarashi had expected a number of things when she woke up. 
She had expected to feel dirty and violated with the telltale aches and pains in her nether regions to taunt her that she had been taken against her will. She was expecting to feel nauseous and sick to her stomach. And she was fearfully expecting to find herself bleeding in the alleyway she had passed out in, stripped of her clothing while leaking out foreign body fluids. What she wasn't expecting was to wake up in a soft bed with heavy covers in what appeared to be a luxurious style bedroom. Sitting up, she checked herself over, surprised to see herself still fully clothed, albeit a little dirty. Slowly, she removed the covers and slid out of bed cautiously scanned her surroundings. Taking a moment to pat herself down, she was relieved to find that she still had all of her weapons and personal effects on her, and after a more personal inspection, the snake mistress let out a sigh of relief to see that she had not been taken against her will. Now just where the hell am I? She thought to herself. And who was that guy from last night? Blurry images of a young man dressed in a dark purple coat with deep blue eyes burned with restrained power and six whisker marks adorning his cheeks came to the forefront of her mind. Not to mention how firm his chest felt when he had picked her up and cradled her head against him just before she blacked out completely. Piecing together these bits of memories, the snake mistress couldn't help but allow a small blush to dust her cheeks. The sound of the door latch softly clicking broke the snake mistress from her musings and alerted her that someone was entering the room. Out of instinct, Anko produced a single kunai from her pouch and readied it in a defensive position. Ah, you are awake I see. The woman states in a polite tone as she enters the room, remaining by the doorway. Either to block her escape or to make her feel at ease, but not entering her personal space, Anko wasn't sure. From what Anko could make out, the woman stood at about 5 foot 8 inches tall, making the woman a good 4 inches taller than herself. Her black hair tied up into a low cropped bun at the back of her head, with a single bang framing the right side of her face. A pair of thin wired glasses adorning her face, giving the woman a rather seductive instructor appearance. A blue collar-like accessory adorned her neck. The rest of her attire consisted of a traditional maid outfit, with a few notable exceptions. First being a silver pauldron covering her left shoulder, and a second the spiked gauntlets that adorned her wrists. Lastly, there was the girdle that wrapped around her midsection, with two armored wings at either side to protect the woman's hips. Who are you? Anko found her voice, not relaxing from her defensive stance. And where the hell am I? I am Yuri Alpha, vice captain of the Pleiades. The now identified Yuri introduced herself in a calm, welcoming tone. As if she were greeting a guest, which wasn't exactly far off. And you are within the great halls of the Great Tomb of Nazareth. Great Tomb of Nazareth. The snake mistress repeated the words, her face scrunched in confusion. Yes. The maid replied. Naruto-sama brought you here last night after you were attacked. Hearing the name of her rescuer, her eyes narrowed as to where she had heard that name before. Almost as if it was a constant presence in the background wherever she went within the village. Suddenly, her eyes widened as she realized why the name sounded so familiar. Naruto, that was the name of the boy the Yon Daimei, sealed the Kyubi inside 13 years ago. While she had not been in the village at the time of the attack, having been dragged off by her sensei at the time. However, she had heard the Anbu that was assigned to watch over her talking loosely about it when she was brought back to the village after Orochimaru had abandoned her in Yumi no Kuni. At the time, the whispering of the boy did mean anything to then 12-year-old abandoned apprentice. Mostly due to the only stigma that surrounded her being the apprentice of a traitor, giving the abandoned prodigy her own issues with the ignorant villagers to deal with. However, now it all made sense as to why she recognized the name. The constant whispering of random civilians and shinobi alike sharing tales with one another of the things that had done or conspired to do to the boy the next time they caught him. Though, most of those whispers ceased around three years ago. The mayor lacks, Anko-san. Yuri spoke, breaking the snake mistress out of her musing for a second time as the maid gestured towards the brandished weapon. While you are a guest of Naruto-sama, you will not come to any harm, so long as you do not provoke any of those that live within these walls. Frowning slightly, Anko slowly relented. Placing her kunai back into its pouch. Normally the infamous snake mistress would brazenly defy any such request, but there was an aura about this maid, this woman that made her think twice of showing such brashness that she was known for. Not to mention the tone Yuri had used, while polite, had an underlying warning of pain and suffering unimaginable if not heeded. Very well, now if you will accompany me. Yuri requested, moving just enough out of the doorway to invite the woman through. Naruto-sama has asked me to escort you to the dining hall for breakfast and so that you can no doubt talk with one another. However, I will stress that you be respectful when addressing him. All right. Anko nervously gulped as she stepped past the woman into the massive hallway. I will do my best to remember that. At this, Yuri couldn't help but let out a soft giggle at the snake mistress's antics. Bringing up her hand to cover her mouth as she did so. Naruto-sama is correct. She mused with a small grin. It is rather entertaining to mess with others. 
Quietly, the two made their way through the massive corridors, with Yuri walking just slightly ahead. Meanwhile, Anko was taking in the sights around her. Taking note of the elaborate statues, vases, and various busts that lined the corridor. None of which the snake mistress was able to identify, though it was clear that the figures the statues and busts embodied were held in high regard. As the two continued their trek, it wasn't lost on the snake mistress about the look she was receiving from the other inhabitants of wherever she was. Anko was no stranger to receiving such looks, but the ones these maids and butlers were sending her felt more like they were looking down on her. As one would look down upon an insect, making her shiver slightly. However, the snake mistress had to do a double take when the pair had walked past a small, stout penguin, like creature barking orders at small number of maids and butlers that were lined up in front of him, all bowed at the waist in a show of respect for the small creature's station above them. That is Eclair. Yuri answered the silent question. He is the assistant butler. The but penguin. Dot Anko stammered, trying to process the rather odd scene she had just witnessed and making a silent bow to ease off the sake for a while. It may come as a surprise to you, the battle maid began. But currently, only Naruto-sama and yourself are the only two humans within the Great Tomb of Nazarick. This bit of information caught Anko by surprise, prompting her to take another quick glance around, noticing how those around herself looked human enough, though now she could see it. It was in their posture, how they walked, and above all. It was in their eyes. How they looked at her as if she were an insignificant insect with restrained hatred and mistrust. So, is that why they all look at me like that? She inquired quietly. In a sense, yes. But don't take it personally. Yuri answered. Those of us that reside within the great tomb of Nazarick hold little love for humans. And witnessing how the villagers have treated Naruto-sama, as well as your own incident last night, has not helped to ease our disposition. However, Naruto-sama has encouraged all to not rashly judge all humans. I see. The snake mistress replied before turning silent as she mulled over what she was told. Though she could understand their point of view, opting not to question the existence of species outside of being human especially when the evidence was staring her in the face. Here we are. Yuri stated, catching Anko's attention as the duo stopped at a large pair of doors. With a smooth movement, the black-haired maid fluidly opened the doors, allowing Anko to get a good view of the massive dining room that was filled with various tables, with one long one in the center of the room. Filled with assortment of food of all kinds. At the center of the table sat the young blonde teen that had came to her aid the previous night. Naruto-sama, our guest is awakened. Hearing this, the young blonde had stopped what he was doing and stood from his spot at the table, before seemingly teleporting across the table, prompting the snake mistress to blink in surprise. Thank you very much, Yuri-chan. The whiskered teen smiled as he approached the duo. It was not missed that the maid in question was blushing at his praise. You may return to your duties. Of course, Naruto-sama. Yuri bowed before turning to Anko and bidding her farewell before disappearing out of the room again. I trust you slept well Midarashi-san. Naruto stated as he turned his attention to the purple-haired woman. I hope you were not too seriously hurt last night. Anko blinked for a moment, unsure of how to respond. Since this young teen was the first person, outside of her fellow ice queens, that showed any genuine concern for her well-being. Hey, hey, I've been through worse. She tried to brush it off, though the young overlord had caught just the tiniest hint of wetness in her eyes. She hides it well. Urza spoke within the blonde's mind. But she is truly touched by your genuine concern for her. Indeed. Naruto mentally replied. She has the same eyes I once had before meeting Ains Jai Jai. Ah, forgive my lack of manners. The young overlord spoke, realizing he was starting to zone out with his short discussion with his tenant. As you no doubt know, I am Naruto Uzumaki, overlord of the Great Tomb of Nazarick. Overlord huh, that's quite the title to have. The snake mistress quirked a brow. Anyways, as you may or may not know, I am the sexy and single, Anko Midarashi. Famed snake mistress of Konoha. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle at the woman's eccentric introduction. A pleasure to meet you, Anko-san. Would you care to join me for breakfast? Naruto offered as he gestured towards the table behind him. Pistanya-chan tends to spoil me for breakfast, and I absolutely cannot finish all that she has prepared. Anko was about to refuse when her stomach rumbled with hunger as the mouth-watering armor wafted into her nostrils, causing her to unconsciously drool a bit. Quickly wiping the evidence from her mouth, the woman sheepishly smiled. Heh, you came to my rescue like a knight in shining armor last night, put me in a room that is far more luxurious than any of the fancy hotels in Kanoha, and now you are offering me breakfast. Anko gave a teasing grin, before allowing her voice to drop to a more husky tone. Are you sure you're not trying to butter me up for a special reward? Before the young overlord could respond to the snake mistress's jest, an explosion of killer intent from three separate sources erupted behind the woman, prompting Anko to quickly turn to face the oncoming threat. 
only to be greeted by the sight of three enraged-looking women. One tall and two shorter. The taller of the three, standing at five foot seven, was a woman of impeccable beauty with lustrous jet black hair and the face of a goddess or a temptress, depending on one's point of view. Dressed in a pure white dress with silky gloves covering her slender hands and a golden spiderweb necklace that covered her shoulders and chest. Golden her eyes as with vertically split pupils lit up with fury. On her left and right temples, two thick horns protruded crookedly, looking like a sort of tiara permanently fixated to her head. At her waist, a pair of black angel-like wings. To the left of the angelic beauty was a shorter woman, only standing four foot seven, looking no older than fourteen with pale and shiny skin with fine facial features and seductive-looking crimson red eyes. Or they would look seductive if they were not burning with righteous fury. Her silver hair tied up into a ponytail through a large red and purple ribbon on top of it all. Her attire consisted of a soft black Victorian-looking evening dress with a big heavy skirt. Her upper body dressed in a lace embellished ribbon and a short tailored jacket, though it was clear to the snake mistress that the silver-haired woman was using padding to fill out her chest. A pair of long lace gloves adorned her sleek hands, not exposing any bit of skin, a large contrast to the taller woman. The last of the trio was a tomboyish-looking girl with dark skin and pointed ears, standing at only four foot four. Her golden shoulder-length hair perfectly contrasting with her heterochromia, with her left eye blue while her right eye was green. Both were lit with fury. She wears a reddish-black scale-like armor, covered by a white and gold vest embroidered with the sigil of Nazareth. The matching set of white trousers and gold-plated shoes accompanied her outfit, as well as an acorn necklace that emitted a golden light. At her waist was a coiled whip that her hands were itching to grasp. Unconsciously taking a step back from the three, Anko couldn't help but to break out in a cold sweat by the sheer and unnatural amount of killing intent the three were exuding, forcing her to drop to a knee as she began to hyperventilate. Countless visions of her gruesome demise flashing before her eyes at the hands of the three before her, ranging from decapitation, dismemberment, and mutilation of her lady parts. Enough. Naruto's voice boomed and echoed throughout the room as he allowed his power to pulse outwards, causing the three monster girls to cease their killer intent and each fall to one knee before him, allowing Anko to take in some much-needed air that she had been deprived of. Anko-san is my guest, and she will be treated as such. Who but Naruto-sama? Albedo pleaded. The vile words that she insinuated. Are no different than what the three of you do. The blonde overlord pointed out, focusing on the pure maiden first. Albedo-chan, you are extraordinarily vocal of the things you would do with me in such detail that the pervert frog fucker could write volumes of his trash books based on your words alone. Shaltier chan he turned his attention to the vampire. You insist on joining me every time I take a bath. And Ora-chan. Now focusing on the dark elf girl kneeling before him. You sneak into my bed every night. Each of the three he had singled out had the decency to look embarrassed, suddenly finding the floor much more interesting. Now comparing her minor jest to all of your actions, she hasn't done anything that would warrant this type of reaction. Be but Naruto-sama, she is only human. We can provide you with so much more than this mortal. Albedo countered, looking up at the blonde overlord. Looking down on others now, Albedo-chan. The boy quickly replied with a raised eyebrow. The succubus sputtered. No. I it's just. Listen, okay. Naruto interrupted. I understand how all of you feel about me, and I am honored to have three beautiful ladies such as yourselves feel that way about me. The trio of monster girls couldn't stop the blush that crept onto their faces. Now, whether or not her playful flirting becomes something more in the future remains to be seen. Naruto continued, sending a playful wink towards the snake mistress when he saw she was about to retort with something. And should that happen, I guarantee on my honor that given time, you will grow to like her as a valued friend and perhaps even a sister. Why is that, Naruto-sama? Ora inquired, adopting a curious expression. Because she has the same eyes I had before all of you came into my life. The overlord responded quietly. Silence hung over the four of them as they realized the weight of his words. Alevdo was the first to stand up and turn to the snake mistress and give a short bow at the waist. I would like to offer our apologies for our actions towards you, Midarashi-san. The succubus spoke, her voice holding an air of seriousness to it prompting the other two girls to follow her example in a rare occurrence of the three of them not fighting amongst each other. Banko blinked a few times, realizing she was being put on the spot right now. Hey, no skin off my back. She replied, albeit a little nervously. I can't blame you for defending your claim, the gaki is handsome. However, as soon as the words left her mouth, she felt a small chill run down her spine and wondered if she had said the wrong thing, without meaning to, since it just came out of her mouth. However, to her surprise, the one named Albedo merely stood straight and smiled at her. On that, we can agree on. She spoke. Naruto-sama is quite handsome. Come ladies. Albedo instructed, turning her attention to her fellow rivals. 
let us return to our duties and leave Naruto-sama to entertain his guest. Bound once more towards the snake mistress in apology, the three departed the room, closing the massive doors behind them. I do apologize for their actions, Anko-san. Naruto said, turning his attention towards the purple-haired woman. The three of them tend to get overzealous when it comes to me. So, in other words they're fangirls. Anko teased, feeling a bit more at ease after the whiskered overlord had come to her defense. Like that Ichiha brat. Yeah, except his fangirls are more worried about their looks, what to wear and if they will break a nail. The blonde shrugged. Mine will level an entire village in my honor. No arguments there. So, hungry? Naruto inquired. With a small chuckle, the snake mistress accepted the invitation, blushing slightly when the whiskered overlord insisted on pulling out a chair for her and pushing it in. After sampling a few of the dishes, she had to admit that the food served was better than anything she had had before. Even her sacred dango couldn't compare. And you get to eat this every day? Anko inquired. Pretty much. Naruto nodded. We'll even have a lunch delivered to me at the academy, made fresh. Damn, must be nice. She muttered to herself, though just loud enough for the whiskered blonde to hear her. What, dango every day not good enough for you? He teased, earning a playful glare from the snake mistress. Tell you what, I will have someone drop some lunch off for you too, every day. How about that? I couldn't possibly. Relax, Anko-san. I insist he interrupted her with a smile. Besides, what kind of friend would I be if I let you starve? All right, all right. You win. Anko smiled, having a feeling that the whiskered teen could be as stubborn and as hard-headed as she was when she set her mind to something. Though as a comfortable silence fell over them, one thing was bugging the snake mistress. What did you mean, that I had eyes like yours? She asked, looking to her host. Exactly that. Naruto replied after a few seconds of silence. When I look in your eyes, I see myself a few years ago. You are lonely and desperate for reliable companionship. To be acknowledged as yourself and not live in the shadows of the sins of others. You have those you consider friends, but you keep them at arm's length, unsure if they are worthy of your trust. Their boisterous personality and don't give a fuck attitude is a front you put up to scare people away so you don't get hurt again. Similar to my mask of being an idiotic prankster. In you, I see a kindred spirit. Banco didn't know how to respond to how painfully accurate the whiskered blonde had described her. Slowly tears began to form in her eyes, feeling completely exposed and vulnerable before the young teen as she broke down and began to cry. However, she was snapped out of her stupor as she felt a pair of arms wrap around her racking body. I didn't tell you this to expose you and leave you bare before me. Naruto whispered into her ear as he comforted her in a hug. I told you this because I know how it feels firsthand to be alone. For the first eight years of my life, I had barely anyone and those I did have couldn't watch over me all the time. At the age of seven, the orphanage the old man trusted to look after me kicked me to the streets. Leaving me vulnerable for the villagers looking to get their pound of flesh for the Kayubi attack. To them, I was never Naruto Uzumaki. He continued, his hand rubbing her back gently. To the mindless masses, I was just the Kayubi in human form, powerless and unable to defend myself against the mobs that formed. While the old man passed laws to protect me, there was little he could actually do to ensure they were followed, especially when some of his own trusted Anbu would allow such things to happen under their watch. Only stepping in to prevent actual death, and even then, they would take their time getting me to the hospital. Amgaki, Anko sniffled slightly, compassing herself as she wiped the tears from her face. Slowly peeling herself from the blonde's arms, albeit reluctantly, but she had a reputation to upload. Why the hell would you stay in the village after all that? Well few in number, there are people here I care about. Naruto replied as he leaned back in his chair. The old man, Aim chan and her father, Tsumdono, and now, you. Anko couldn't help but smile at that because she knew that he had meant every word he said. The years she had toiled in the torture and interrogation branch of Kanoha under Ibiki had her well versed in reading one's body language and tone to gauge if a person was sincere or not. The sense of joy, a mostly foreign feeling for the famed snake mistress, swelled up inside her that she had at least one more who saw her as Anko and not the traitor's apprentice. However, she was quickly reminded just why the feeling of joy was a foreign sensation for her as a burning pain flared up at the base of her neck where her shoulder and neck met causing her to lurch forward and groan in pain as she grasped at the spot where the curse mark was located. Anko-san? Naruto asked, his voice full of concern as he immediately leaned forward to support her. Seeing her hand clasped firmly over the base of her neck, he gently moved her hand away so he could get a clear look at what was afflicting her, allowing her to grasp his own hand to stave off the pain she was in. Ah that bastard Orochimaru Pupa Tha is on me, Beth before he abandoned me. Anko grunted out through the pain, squeezing the blonde's hand as hard as she could, though the blonde showed no reaction to her grip, instead he was focused on the cursed mark. Scan. 
Naruto called out the spell as his eyes began to glow with a blue radiance, allowing him to see the inner workings of the seal. It appears the snake has implanted a small piece of his soul into the curse mark. Urza observed, growling slightly. So it appears. Naruto frowned, but allowed a smirk to visit his lips. However, this just made it easier to deal with. But for now, let's do this. Dispelling the scant spell he had used, Naruto channeled his magic into a fourth tier C level spell to isolate and restrain the soul fragment, giving the snake mistress a much needed reprieve as her breathing began to steady. Well what did you do? She asked, catching her breath. I scanned the mark and was able to identify why it was afflicting you so. Naruto explained as he casually opened up a small portal in front of her and reached in to pull out a small purple-colored gem of some kind. Turns out, the bastard injected part of his soul into the mark, and from what I was able to determine, it feeds off of negative emotions. So, when you feel anything joyful or happy, it responds aggressively. Fucking figures. Anko spat, cursing her traitorous former sensei. Always fucking up my life. The good news is, is that I can remove it. The blonde simply stated. Soul, mark and all. Hearing this, Anko froze and looked over towards the blonde teen. How? She ventured to ask, not wanting to get her hopes up. I've tried almost everything to get rid of that damnable thing, even completely slicing it from my neck, but it just kept coming back. Even approached that fucking pervert, only to get told that he would only look at it after I had slept with him. Naruto scowled upon hearing this, but shook it off for the time being. Making a silent bow to make that perverted bastard pay down the road when his sorry excuse of a godfather would try and enter his life in order to manipulate the prophecy that was supposedly around him. Oh yes, he was well aware of the vague prophecy the perverted Sanon was obsessed with. The one that stated he would supposedly would shape the shinobi world in his image. Now, you're going to feel a small burning sensation, but it will be significantly less than it was before. He explained, receiving a nod in confirmation from the snake mistress. Bringing the purple gem closer towards the woman's neck, it began to glow and pulse with energy. Soul Trap Naruto cast the spell, causing Anko to hiss, as a burning sensation came from the place where her curse mark was. Though true to the whiskered blonde's words, the pain was far less than it had been earlier, making it far more bearable. And then, there was nothing. Pulling back, Anko could see that the once purple crystal-like gem was now a sickly black color. Is that? Yes. The blonde answered before she could finish. This is the snake bastard soul, or rather, the part that was within you. Tentatively reaching up, the snake mistress rubbed the spot where the curse mark once was, surprised to find her skin completely smooth and unmarred. No raised marks, indentations or scaring just smooth unblemished skin. It's gone. She whispered. It's actually gone. Tears of happiness pooling in her eyes as she launched forward and embraced the whiskered teen in a firm hug, inadvertently smashing his head between her mounds of flesh on her chest. All while repeating her thanks in hushed whispers. I swear, for freeing me from that bastard's mark, I am yours. Anko vowed. You want someone killed, I'll do it. You want someone to disappear, I'll do it, no questions asked. Hell, if you want to knock me up and use me as a sex slave, I will give myself to you. Just. How about, you just be my friend. Naruto offered as he gently removed himself from her arms, hiding the blush that was creeping up on his face, due to where it was just seconds ago. And hey, if it becomes something more later, all the better, right? Friends. I like that. The snake mister smiled, a rare, genuine smile. Unfortunately, we have to cut this short. I have to get to the academy, and I trust you have your own duties to attend to. Naruto informed the snake mistress, noting the time. How about dinner tonight? Are you inviting me to a date, Naruto-kun? Anko grinned, her teasing nature coming back. After all, she did have a reputation to uphold, regardless if the whiskered teen before her had laid her bare and exposed. Well, I was merely being polite and extending an invitation to get to know my newfound friend. But I would be remiss if I were to turn down a date with such a beautiful woman as yourself, so a date it is then, Anko-chan. Naruto responded fluidly with a foxy grin. Amgaki, able to match me at my own game. She couldn't help but think. Wordlessly, Naruto moved his hand in a circular motion, opening a portal in front of the two that showed an empty alleyway. Though from the trash bins, the snake mistress could see that it was the one that was located directly behind the Raymond stand. Shall we? He asked, gesturing towards the portal. Taking the hint, Anko stepped through the portal unsure of what to expect. Only to find her immediately in the alleyway she had just seen. Turning around, she saw her newfound friend stepping through as well before the portal closed behind him. Normally, I would teleport to my apartment I am supposed to be staying in, but I figured it would look suspicious and lead to some rather unwanted rumors to circulate if we were seen leaving at the same time. Naruto explained. Not like I don't have enough of those kinds of rumors going around about me, anyways. 
Anko grumbled, though thankful for the young overlord's consideration for her divinity. At any rate, this is where we part ways for now. Naruto stated, it was a pleasure to meet you, and I am looking forward to our date this evening. Yeah, yeah. Anko chuckled. Just don't get all sappy with the flowers, chocolate, and music and shit. Tuckling to himself, Naruto departed the alleyway and disappeared down the road towards the academy. Leaving the snake mistress behind to tend to her own duties. Shaking her head, Anko couldn't help but smile. Not even a full day with the whiskered teen, and he has already done more for her than the entire collective of the village combined. And the only thing he had asked for in return was companionship. True, and honest companionship with no ulterior motives. A kindred spirit as he had called her. Friends, huh? She mused to herself. Maybe something more in the future. But the slight skip in her step, the snake mistress stepped out onto the main road and proceeded to make her way towards her place of work. She was in such a good mood that the usual glares and whispers behind her back she typically received daily couldn't even dampen her spirits. Hell, Orochimaru himself could appear in front of her, and she would merely laugh at him and continue on her way. Benko. A voice called out from behind her, prompting the snake mistress to turn around. Only to be greeted by the sight of two of her fellow ice queens swiftly making their way towards her in the form of Hana Inuzuka and Kurana Yuhi. Shit. Anko mentally cursed, not really looking forward to the question she was about to be asked. Especially regarding the events that had happened the night prior and where she had disappeared to. While Naruto had not outright said it, it was clear to her that the whiskered teen wanted to keep Nazaruk a secret. Uh, hey girls. Anko nervously greeted the two once they reached her. Earning a glare from each of them in response. Academy. Naruto let out a bored sigh as he leaned back in his assigned seat and pulled out a tome full of high-tiered spells that he had borrowed from Nazarek's library as he waited for the class to officially start, casting a subtle illusion spell over it to make it look like a run-of-the-mill textbook. Just in case someone got too curious for their own good and attempted to read of his shoulder, not that they would be able to understand any of the gibberish that was scrawled on the pages since it was written in runes rather than words. Slowly, the rest of the class began to filter into the classroom and take their assigned seats. Only a scant few sending a glare his way, most of which were among the Achiha fan girls and random civilian boys who were looking to impress the aforementioned girls. As for the rest of the class that comprised of more notable civilian families, such as Sakura Hurano, the daughter of one of the civilian council members that oversaw the village's economical flow, and clan heirs. While she was one of the more vocal of the Achiha fan girls, Sakura had managed to balance her love obsession with her studies, allowing her to float around the top of the class in academics and was a sure candidate for Kinoichi of the year come graduation, despite her civilian heritage. While she had initially butted heads with a whiskered overlord, trying to fit in with the rest of the civilian kids by attempting and horribly failing at bullying the young blonde, the two had come to a silent agreement to just let one another be. Next was the clan heirs. Hinata Hyuga, Ino Yamanaka, Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akimichi, Shino Aburami, Kiba Inuzuka, and Sasuke Cha. Ironically enough, the only one Naruto had any issues with was the Inuzuka heir with his constant claim of being the alpha male of the class and trying to flirt and assert his male dominance over his female classmates. One of his primary targets was the Hyuga heir, Hinata. Normally, she was a reserved girl and as shy as a wallflower, but on more than one occasion had the teenage girl laid the Inuzuka air out with precise and painful jaikin strikes. It also didn't help that Tsum's youngest pup, as she called him, felt intimidated by the overlord's mere presence and acted brash to hide his insecurity. There had been one instance when Kiba and tried to intimidate Naruto in a staring contest and had attempted to headbutt him, only to render himself unconscious when the Yuzumaki's head didn't even budge. As for the Nara, Akimichi, and Aburami heirs, they were mostly neutral when it came to the blonde. Never really going out of their way to interact with him, while at the same time, not taking part in any of the shenanigans that the more foolish of the class would engage in when it came to him. For Shikamaru, it was too troublesome. Toji was steadfast at his best friend's side, which mostly consisted of laying down and watching the clouds with the Nara. Whereas Shino was an introvert, choosing on to speak when spoken to. Ironically, the two he got along with the most were the Yamanka and Achiha heirs. But Ino, a rival for the Achiha with her best friend Sakura, the two would engage in deep discussions about psychology, mental ailments and treatments, as well as practical chakra theory. It also wasn't a surprise that the Yamanka heiress was in direct competition with Sakura for the Kinoichi of the Year achievement. While he didn't consider her a precious person just yet, she was at least a valued classmate and future comrade. Maybe a friend in the future. Lastly, was the Achiha himself. Currently, Sasuke and his mother, Mikoto, were the only two surviving Ichiha within the village after their clan was massacred four years ago by Sasuke's older brother, Itachi. Supposedly to test his own strength, if the official story was to be believed. 
however Naruto had his suspicions that there was more to it than what was officially stated. Mainly because there were too many holes in the cover story, and it appeared that Sasuke had similar thoughts, since his primary goal was to chase down his older brother and get the truth from him. As for the Achiha himself, he mostly viewed the blonde as a rival to test his skills against. Being one of the few students that wasn't afraid to engage in a full contact spar with the Achiha. Though what Sasuke was unaware of was just how much Naruto was holding back in their spars, nor the illusion spells he would cast on himself to fake damage done. A rivalry of sorts was the primary reason the civilian fangirls hated him, since he dared to be as strong as their beloved Sasuke. If only they knew. After a couple more minutes, one of the instructors finally entered the room. Sending a mild glare towards the whiskered teen before taking his place before the class. Well the glare was nothing new, since Naruto was well aware of the fact that the man blamed him for his parents' death, the fact that he was alone was. Usually he had a partner that would aid in the class's instruction. It was then that he realized that one of the men that had attempted to rape Anko the night prior was none other than the silver-haired instructor. M.M., I thought he looked familiar. The whiskered overlord mused with a slight grin. Remembering the man's face contorting in pain when the blonde had crushed the would-be rapist's heart. Looks like he abandoned his idea to ambush you at your apartment and instead went to have some other fun. Urza added with a slight growl, as her thoughts were similar to Naruto's when it came to rapists. Iruka sensei where is Mizuki-sensei? A purple-haired civilian girl asked Ami if the blonde recalled her name correctly. Is he sick? Unfortunately, Mizuki-sensei was found dead this morning. The now-identified Aruka informed the class, earning a series of gasps of shock. An investigation is being launched to find the demon who murdered him. It wasn't lost on the young overlord that even with no evidence, the man was blaming him for his partner's death. Though at least this time, he would correct. Not that it mattered, since the investigation would turn up nothing that would point to him. If anything, they would find incriminating evidence to condemn the bastards. I wonder what Anko-chan is doing right now. He mused as he tuned out the starting lectures. Oh, so it's Anko-chan already, huh? The Kyuubi teased. You've bonded with her quickly. Like I said, she's a kindred spirit. Bango stand. Said Snake Mistress sneezed as her two friends were interrogating her about what had happened the previous night. Fortunately, Ibiki had given her the day off due to being lied on those requiring to be cracked open since dead men couldn't scream and spill secrets. Great, now who the hell is thinking of me? Anko groaned. So, let me get this straight. Kurinai phrased as she was trying to picture what her friend had told her. Mizuki had somehow managed to spike your drink with something and then lead you to an alleyway where two of his friends were waiting and then attempted to rape you and then someone came and killed them and took you to his place after you passed out. To the game Jutsu Mistress, it made no sense. She had known the silver-haired man for years and had gone on several missions with him before he became an instructor at the academy and had trusted him with her life. But to hear someone she considered a trusted friend accused of such a crime, but another friend made her feel conflicted. That's what happened. The snake mistress shrugged, taking a bite out of her dango, though compared to the earlier breakfast she had, it paled in comparison. It's not that I don't believe you. Kurinai sighed. It's just that I find it hard to believe. Mizuki-sen was a trusted comrade that I went on countless missions outside the village with. Someone I could trust to watch my back. Believe me or don't believe me. Anko sighed, dropping the now empty stick. No skin off my back. Kurinai frowned at the dismissive nature of her friend. And are you sure your rescuer, she emphasized the word. Didn't have anything to do with your attack and framed Mizuki-san. Immediately the ruby-eyed woman realized that this was the wrong thing to say as killer intent leaked out from the snake mistress and a raging fury burned like a wildfire within her brown pupilless eyes as she leveled a glare at the game jutsu mistress. Don't. Anko hissed dangerously. Don't you even dare consider making that pathetic wanna rapist a victim. As far as I am concerned, that bastard got what he deserved. Pushing off the bar stool aggressively, she tossed some money on the countertop to pay for her meal and stormed out of the stand, leaving behind a gobsmacked kurinai. Meanwhile, Hana was sniffing the air curiously, trying to identify the familiar scent she smelled wafting off of the snake mistress. Her eyes flickering as she tried to identify the scent, so far coming up with a complete blank. Mentally racking her brain as to just where she had caught that scent from before. Why? She mentally asked herself. Why in the name of Kami does that smell so familiar? One and a half month later. Shadows danced across the large room in the overnight hours, while everyone in the fire daimyo's palace leapt, minus the guards that patrolled the halls and grounds. The large room illuminated by the fire crackling from the fireplace located behind an overly sized wooden desk and chair. Soft giggling elicited from the large chair as two short legs swung to and fro. 
in the rather oversized chair, compared to her petite frame, a nine-year-old girl sat, reading over the various scrolls that littered the large desk before casting it into the fire. Another political marriage proposal. The girl scoffed. How foolish of them to think I would just accept any man. This was Renner Therrier Chartalon Ryle Vaself, formerly known as Tomoko Kanita, the fire daimyo's daughter and his golden princess, as the man had affectionately nicknamed her. She had long gold hair that draped over her shoulders and cascaded down her back, stopping just above her waistline, silky smooth and supple. Her vibrant dark blue eyes shone like sapphires in the dancing light, filled with a gentle warmth. Though if one were to look closely, they would be able to see the fires of malicious mischief hidden behind those sapphire pools. As to why she now referred to herself as Renner, instead of her given name at birth, was due to an unfortunate incident that transpired five years ago when she was only four years old. It had started out as only a minor headache that had served little more than an irritation, however, as the weeks passed, the headaches grew worse and more severe, almost as if something were trying to break free from her skull. Weeks had turned into months as the headaches continued, it had grown so severe that it would render the poor child unconscious, causing no small amount of grief for her parents, who had every medical professional in the capital, and all of Hai no Kuni examine their daughter, only to come up empty-handed each time. This had continued for nearly two months before she slipped into a coma that had lasted four months. The fire daimyo's religious advisors had speculated that a demon or an evil spirit was attempting to possess the girl and voiced their concerns to the fire lord, urging the man to have his daughter exercised and warded before the spirit could succeed in taking over the young girl. However, the man would hear none of it, waving off their concerns as paranoid superstition. And so it was, when she finally woke from her coma, the soul of Tomoko Kanita was no more. The Witch of the Falling Kingdom had taken her place, unknown to the unfortunate girl's parents whom were too ecstatic to see their baby girl awake and healthy once more to question any of the changes in the girl's personality and mannerisms. Disregarding the implications of their daughter's new name, simply waving it off as something children do. If only my pet didn't betray me. She snarled before casting yet another marriage proposal into the fire violently in anger at the memory. She had just completed the final requirements for the ritual to send both her and her beloved pet through time and space to follow Lord Ains. Only for her to be stabbed in the back, literally, by Climb. Hence why it had taken her so long for her spirit to arrive in this new world, and then finding that her chosen reincarnation was already occupied by another soul. Something she had set out to correct immediately upon her awakening. After all I had done for the ungrateful mongrel. Taking him in off the streets, giving him clothing, shelter and affection. She seethed and how does he repay me? By turning his back on me and running off with that tavern whore. Ignoring the scrolls for the time being, she took the time to compose herself once more. Closing her eyes and taking in deep breaths to allow her anger to fade away. As she opened her eyes once more, she stole a glance at the clock near the desk and frowned. It was nearing four in the morning, within the hour, her father would be up. Letting out a small sigh, she began to organize the scrolls back how they were, so as to leave no evidence that she had been in here. However, she froze when her eyes fell upon one particular scroll that bared a familiar sigil. It can't be. She thought as she carefully broke open the wax seal and unrolled the scroll, her eyes widening as she read its contents. Lord Yashiyuki Kanita. I am writing to you on behalf of the Nazra clan, currently residing within the great village of Kanahagakur, in request to officially establish our clan within the great nation of Hai, no Kuni post haste. As a clan, we have resided within the walls of Kanahagakur for a number of years, decades even, and feel that it is time we firmly place our roots and have a place to call home once again, after wandering the lands aimlessly for so long. Our clan is old, ancient even, and as such we hold a massive amount of wealth, some of which we have used to purchase a large compound within the village, and unique capabilities that would be of benefit for the defense and overall betterment of not only Kanahagakur, but Hai no Kuni as a whole. Unfortunately, I am unable to divulge the full extent of our capabilities, I am sure you understand a clan's desire to protect its secrets. No doubt you are curious as to why we have sent this request directly to you, instead of the Hokage and his esteemed council. The truth is, with the exception of the Hokage and sparse members, the council has a biased view of sorts with our chosen clan heir. An orphan boy, known as Naruto Uzumaki, the Nazra clan head had saw potential in and had taken under his wing, as well as groomed him to be a fine clan head in the future. As you can imagine, we would prefer to avoid such unnecessary spectacle and would rather have our request presented before an unbiased audience for consideration. We eagerly await your correspondence. Signed. Demir Jeldabayath, Acting Clan Head. Renner read over the request once more, then again to ensure she had not missed anything. She was elated to see that Nazarick had indeed arrived within this world, decades ahead of her it would seem, but she was also confused as the scroll made no mention of Lardanes. Which concerned her greatly. 
She reasoned that he could be keeping himself hidden for the time being and having Demiurge acting in his stead. However, if this were part of one of his machinations, he would have assumed the identity of a wandering warrior, or in this world a shinobi, to get a feel for the layout of the land and to build up his reputation like he had done before. However, she had heard no tales of a wandering shinobi, swordsman nor warrior that had caught her interest to indicate they were Lord Ains in disguise. Frowning slightly, she gazed at the clan heir's name, Naruto Uzumaki. She had seen the boy's name brought up before in other documents in her father's office, full name being Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. He was the sole child of the now deceased Yon Daime Hokage, Minato Namikaze and Kishina Uzumaki, the former Anbu commander, codenamed Kamenu, as well as the previous Shinchuriki of the Kayubi no Yoko. A burden that had regretfully been passed down to their son. But this information alone, she knew that this boy was not Lord Ains. However, the letter strongly implied that Lord Ains himself had saw potential in the boy and had essentially named him his successor. For what reason, she didn't know but she knew who did. Coming to a decision, she forged her father's signature and stamped its approval, making the Nazra clan establishment official, before rolling the scroll up neatly and carefully reapplying the wax seal, before setting it in the pile of approved scrolls. Quickly, she cleaned up the desk and departed the room, leaving no trace of her prescience. Now, all she needed to do is manipulate her father into either making an official trip to Kanoha with her or at least allowing her and her mother to travel there. Either way, she would meet with this Naruto Uzumaki and find out what had happened to Lord Ain's Zool gown. Kanoha, two weeks later. Anko Mitarashi couldn't help but feel a tinge of giddiness as the minutes ticked by, eager to meet up with the young overlord once more. Over the last two months it had become a common occurrence for the snake mistress to enjoy the company of the whiskered blonde, oftentimes blowing off hanging out with her fellow ice queens in favor of spending time with the teenage Uzumaki within the confines of the great tomb of Nazarick. It wasn't that she no longer enjoyed their company, it was simply that Naruto actually understood her on a deeper level. There were no looks of pity she would occasionally receive from both Kurinai and Hana when they would gather together, nor the sidelong glances Yuga would subtly send her way. No, when she was alone with Naruto she could allow her defenses to fall and just be herself. Not the disgraced apprentice of Orochimaru of the Sanin, not the sadistic psycho bitch that loved to torture people, not even the infamous snake mistress of Konoha. Just Anko Mitarashi the woman. The young overlord had also made good on his promise to ensure she got a delectable lunch every day, much to the surprise of her fellow ice queens when they saw her eating something other than dango. Even sparking some jealousy when the three of them had caught a whiff of the tantalizing aroma coming from the snake mistress's meal. Anko still didn't know how he did it, considering the whiskered blonde would be attending the academy at the time, but the meal would be ready and waiting for her at her apartment by the time her lunch time would roll around. You look like you're in a good mood. Came a teasing voice from her left, prompting the snake mistress to turn her attention towards the source, seeing the form of Hana Inuzuka and her three canine partners, making her way towards her with Kurinai not far behind her. Normally Yuga would be with them, but the young Anbu was currently on the clock, as it were. But food as good as this, how can I not be in a good mood? Anko grinned as the two women took their seats next to her, each shooting her an envious glare. So, the Inuzuka woman began. You ever going to introduce us to this mystery man of yours? Anko gave a mock-thinking gesture before shaking her head, a grin on her face. Nah, think I am going to be selfish and keep him all to myself. Anko said as she stuck out her tongue at Hana. What, afraid we might steal him from you? The feral young woman smirked. Nah, the snake mistress dismissed her friend's jest. More worried that Nai-chan will scare him away. Hey. The game jutsu mistress exclaimed. You have a point there. Han relented with a teasing smile, earning herself a glare from the ruby-eyed woman. Oh relax, you know she's right Kurinai-chan, you go into big sister mode whenever a guy approaches any of us. You haven't exactly had the best track records when it's come to men, you know. Kurinai could only wince at the jab at her current track record. After Mizuki's murder, an investigation was launched to discover the culprit. However in a surprising turn of events, Anbu had discovered damning evidence against the deceased Chunin when they investigated the man's apartment. Hidden in a secure cache, just behind the man's bed, were several stacks of papers and journals detailing the man's dealing with a notorious traitor, Orochimaru, monetary transactions between himself and the snake Sanin, meeting points and more. The journals themselves gave detailed accounts of the man's personal targets. Various women that resided within the village, some of which had mysteriously vanished months ago with no trace. It was evident as to what had happened to them when compared to the transactions made between the two men. They had been sold to Orochimaru for a fate worse than death. Among the man's targets were none other than the Gain Jutsu mistress, whom was his primary target, as well as the other ice queens. As it happened to be, Kurinai had been the man's initial target the night Anko was nearly raped. 
which had left the Gain Jutsu mistress feeling extremely guilty that she had unknowingly put her friend, almost sister figure, in danger, simply because she trusted the man. There was no doubt in Kurinai's mind that if the roles had been reversed and she stayed alone with Mizuki, he would have succeeded that night, leaving her broken and defiled. Unlike Anko, she didn't have the high resistance to drugs like the snake mistress did. Which begged the question. If she had been the victim, would the one who rescued Anko have arrived in time to save her? Would the act have even happened in the same location? Speaking of men, Anko disrupted the ruby-eyed woman's train of thoughts. How are things going between you and Asuma? Last I heard you were thinking of taking it to the next level. Kurinai could only groan at the question. As if her track record wasn't bad enough. In between trying to hook up Hana with Kakashi Hot Aki, due to him holding the dog summoning contract and the feral woman's partnership with canines. A perfect match one would think. It had been a disaster. Upon their meeting, Hot Aki had the audacity to inquire about just how close the bond between an Inuzuka and their canine partner was, claiming he had heard rumors. It had not helped matters any when he had implied that Hana herself must be insatiable due to have three partners instead of just one like most Inuzuka clan members. When she had confronted him about his remarks, the man had merely played it off that he was only joking to lighten the mood. Then there was the debacle when she had tried to play matchmaker between Anko and Aruka. The date, if one could call it that, had lasted all of five minutes as the Chunin instructor couldn't stop staring at the snake mistress's breast, which had irritated the woman to no end. After a few misguided comments, the date had ended with the Chunin on the floor with a rather large lump on his head and an extremely pissed off Anko Midarashi. Suppose I really shouldn't be surprised by now, Kurinai sighed as she lay her head on the countertop, lamenting her current track record with men. Bastard was sleeping around on me with some horror in the red light district. Damn. Anko sighed, reaching over and giving her friend a comforting rub on the back. It really did seem the poor woman couldn't catch a break when it came to men. You know Nai-chan. Perhaps men aren't your thing. Hana allowed a mischievous grin to spread across her face. Maybe you should start looking for a good woman or two instead, since you have a better track record with them. Didn't think you swung that way, Hana-chan. Kurinai mumbled from the countertop, giving the feral woman a critical eye. What? The Inuzuka smirked. You didn't think men are the only targets of seduction missions, did you? Anko couldn't help but to snicker at her friend's expense, noticing the embarrassed expression on the game Jutsu mistress's face. Though there was a degree of truth in what Hana had said, seduction missions didn't just focus on men, but women as well, and both Kanoichi and Shinobi had to be able to play both sides of the field as required, depending on their target sexual preference. Granted she had never been assigned any herself, with the elder council members of the village, preferring to keep her within the walls of the village for security reasons. Paranoid bastards. I won't lie, Hana continued. I have never let any of my male targets cross the line with me, but there have been more than a few steamy nights with my female targets. Looking over, she could see Kurinai's face doing a perfect impression of a tomato, ready to burst. Turning her attention to the snake mistress, she watched as Anko checked the time before packing away the leftovers of her lunch and getting up to leave. As much as I would love to stay in chat ladies, I got a date. Anko grinned before taking to the roofs and disappearing out of sight. Leaving behind a still slightly flustered Kurinai and an amused Hana. She's going to see her mystery guy again. Hana commented with a snicker. I just wish she would introduce us to him already or at least tell us. Anything about him. Kurinai groaned in frustration. I hate that it feels like she ditches us to go hang out with this guy, whoever he is. Relax night chan The brunette woman advised her friend. The fact that Anko-chan feels secure enough to be alone with this guy for hours on end, every day, should say something, especially after what happened two months ago. Kurinai involuntarily flinched in guilt. Enough of that Kurina Yuhi. Hana chastised, seeing her friend's reaction. You had no idea what the bastard intended to do that night. So stop blaming yourself. I know, the ruby-eyed woman sighed. It's just that. Dot. No, the feral woman interrupted. It's as you said. You knew him for years and went on missions with him. There is no feasible way you could have known his intentions, no matter how you look at it. You're right. Kurinai replied after a handful of seconds, she still felt guilty, but Hana was right. She had no reason to doubt Mizuki's intentions when he had offered to walk Hanko home that night. Think I may put my name in as a Jonin sensei this year. Seeing her friend was attempting to change the subject, Hana nodded in acknowledgement. Okage-sama has given me the rest of the week off. Hana replied before frowning slightly. Starting next week, I get to take Mizuki's place as the assistant instructor alongside Aruka. While she had nothing against helping instruct the next generation of Shinobi and Kinoichi, she wasn't looking forward to working alongside Aruka. Aside from the man's failed date with Anko, his overall personality just rubbed the Inuzuka the wrong way. 
The way he carried himself just felt false, as if he were projecting what he wanted others to see him as, rather than himself. Not to mention her younger brother Kiba had complained about the man showing preferential treatment to various students, namely the female students in the class, all while preaching about not playing favorites. Of course he had also complained about how a blonde-haired kid by the name of Naruto Uzumaki had embarrassed him in front of the entire class, though he never said how the boy had embarrassed him, leaving her to doubt his words and believe that he more than likely made a fool of himself. Think you can do me a favor and keep an eye on Hinata-chan for me? Kurunai inquired as she viewed the usually shy Hyuka as something of an adopted little sister of sorts. Sure, Hana shrugged. Mom already asked me to look out for a young man by the name of Naruto Uzumaki anyways. Any particular reason why? I can't give the details, but suffice to say that my mother considers him family. She explained the best she could without breaking any laws surrounding the blonde-haired teenager. I never got to meet him personally, but from what my mother said, he's a good kid that got dealt a shitty hand in life. Kurunai merely nodded, accepting the answer. One thing she had learned while being friends with a young Inuzuka woman was that when her mother was not a woman to be questioned. If feral clan head said someone was good person, then they were a good person. No ifs, ands, or buts. Simple as that. Which made the game Jutsu Mistress want to kick herself in the butt for waving off Tsum's warning about Asuma. Being a good man and a good mate are two completely different things. The Inuzuka matriarch had told her. The commotion down the street broke the two women out of their conversation, prompting both to get up and see what was going on. As they neared the main road where the commotion was coming from, they could make out a contingent of samurai, as well as the daimyo's own twelve guardian ninja, escorting an ornate carriage being drawn by two beautiful pure white horses towards the Hokage's building. What's Lord Yashiyuki doing here? Kurunai ventured to ask, since the man would rarely leave the capital unless it was for a diplomatic excursion or to tend to more pressing matters. And say, but it looks like his daughter is with him. Hana commented as she spied the luscious golden locks of the nine-year-old girl sitting alongside her father in the carriage. So, maybe this is more of a random social visit. Maybe. The ruby-eyed woman nodded. Guess we'll find out later if it concerns us. True. The feral woman grinned. Bet the civilian side of the council is shitting themselves right now though. After all, nothing made various members of the council more nervous than when the reigning lord over the very land their home resided in made unannounced visits, as it usually didn't bode well for their own personal ventures. Okage's office. Irizin Saratobi sat behind his large wooden desk, strumming his fingers across the surface as he tried to rack his brain as to why the fire daimyo would be visiting the village this day unannounced. Behind him were his four Anbu guards that would normally be hidden throughout the room, however, with the visitation of the daimyo, it was a courtesy that all guards be visible in the room while the fire lord was present. This was mostly done as a gesture of trust to show that the village leader had nothing to hide. The elder man didn't have to wait long before a soft knock at the door indicated his guests had arrived. With a quick invitation, both large doors were fully opened, allowing for four of the daimyo's personal guard to enter ahead of the fire lord and his daughter. Lord Yashiyuki, here is in greeted with a small bow at the waist. What a pleasant surprise for you to visit us today. Here is in, my old friend. The Fire Lord greeted in return with a soft smile. I apologize for coming unannounced, but my little golden princess was rather insistent that I oversee this personally. Oversee what exactly, if you don't mind me asking? The San Deami inquired, clearly confused. I understand your confusion my old friend, two weeks ago, a scroll was delivered to my desk, requesting the founding of a new clan within the village. The daimyo explained as he took his seat in front of Hirazan's desk, prompting the village leader to do the same. The Nazra clan as they are called. I am afraid I have not heard of this clan. Hirazan admitted with a hint of embarrassment, as the man prided himself of being knowledgeable of every clan that resided within the village, no matter how large or small. Though I am curious as to why they would have sent the request to you rather than myself. Apparently, there are members of your council that hold a biased view of the clan's chosen heir. Yashiyuki stated with a sigh. A young man by the name of Naruto Uzumaki. Hearing this, Hiruzen's eyes widened in shock, as did various members of his personal Anbu, none more so than the cat mask Anbu, as she had watched over the young teen throughout the years. Partially out of her own sense of duty, but mostly to honor her sensei's memory and look after her son in her place. Throughout the years of her watching over him, she never witnessed anything that would stand out of this mysterious clan approaching him. Though she surmised that it was possible they could have approached him when she was unable to watch over the whiskered youth. Hiruzen on the other hand was going over countless scenarios within his mind of the implications this held. Was this mysterious Nazra clan a threat, an ally, or something else? Not to mention the fact that they had taken an interest in young Naruto. 
Again, he wasn't sure if it was a mere coincidence that they had approached the boy or if they were aware of just what the boy held and desired to use the power of the demon fox for their own gain. He also briefly pondered if this was the reason the young Yuzumaki had stopped visiting him over the years. I suppose it would be prudent to meet with this Nazra clan. Hiruzen stated after a handful of seconds, if only to sate his own curiosity and assess their motives. Niko, if you would be so kind as to retrieve Naruto Yuzumaki and bring him here, I believe he should still be in the academy. Wordlessly, the lone female Anbu departed the room in a swirl of leaves to carry out her orders. Not even a full minute later there was a knock at the door, prompting the elder village leader to look at the door in a questioning manner. Ah, forgive me Hokage Dono. Yashiyuki spoke up, seeing the expression on his friend's face. I took the initiative to send a few of my personal to the clan's compound to invite the acting clan head to join us for this meeting upon my arrival. Turning to his own guard he motioned for them to allow the individual entry into the room. Without question, two moved to either side of the door and opened them wide, exposing a rather lanky figure, standing just shy of six feet tall, dressed in a rather elegant-looking three-piece red dinner suit, consisting of an overcoat, slacks, and a simple red necktie. Accompanied by a white dress shirt and a pair of black gloves and dress shoes. A pair of dark silver-tinted glasses obscuring his eyes. Off to the side, Renner silently gasped as she took in the sight of the demon emperor and floor guardian of the seventh floor of the great tomb of Nazareth. If there had been any doubt in her mind prior, it was snuffed out now. Demiurge's prescience confirmed that Nazareth was here, within this village. Now, she needed to discover what happened to Lord Ains and why this Naruto Yuzumaki was named the Lixair. Greetings your grace. The tall man greeted the Fire Lord first, giving a deep bow before turning to greet the others of note within the room. Lord Hokage and of course, Milady. Demiurge gelled Abayath, acting head of the Nazareth clan at your service. You said you are the acting clan head. Renner ventured to ask, deciding that she could no doubt get the answer to one of her questions simply out of childlike curiosity. What does that mean? Regrettably, our beloved clan head passed on three years ago. Demiurge smiled sadly, earning a frown from the blonde-haired girl. Unfortunately, our clan heir is still too young to officially take over the clan, as such, I have been asked to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the clan until such time young Naruto can officially take the mantle. If I may inquire, here is an interjected. Just how did you come to meet young Naruto Yuzumaki? An understandable question, Lord Hokage. The demon gave a friendly smile. I am sure it is odd that a clan not only take in an outsider, but name them clan heir. The elder village leader merely nodded. I admit that I am curious as to what led to this myself. The fire lord added, alongside an eager nod from the man's daughter. Very well. The lanky man smiled, taking a seat in the second chair in front of the desk, while Renner made herself comfortable on the two-person couch that was located near the wall across from the desk. It must have been five years ago now, give or take a few months. Ain Sama had decided to take a peaceful stroll through the village to familiarize himself with the place he wanted to call home. Demiurge began the well-rehearsed story as to how they met Naruto. As it were, he ventured a bit too close to the location you know of as the Forest of Death, the northern quarter to be exact if I remember correctly. Those in the room that were familiar with that particular stretch of forest paled when they had heard that a presumed civilian had wandered too close to it, let alone that particular section of the forest. Even the Chunin exams were warded off towards the more southern section of the forest to prevent any unnecessary deaths in an already deadly exam. In fact, there was only one person in all of Konoha that dared to enter that part willingly, and that was none other than Anko Mitarashi, the resident snake mistress. It is unclear how, but Ain Sama was beset upon by a pack of feral canines, perhaps wolves, injuring him severely. The dark-haired demon continued with his tale. It was then that a young boy in ragged clothing and a dirt-filled face had answered his screams for help, rushing in and throwing rocks towards the beasts. Demiurge paused for a moment, chuckling. He had unfortunately even hit Ain Sama in the head with one of the rocks, giving him a rather sizable lump. After the boy had it ran out of rocks, he proceeded to pick up a stick and began swinging it wildly, chasing the beasts off. He paused to feel the atmosphere of the room, seeing that he had each of them entranced with his tail. It was sometime after that night that Ain Sama took young Naruto under his wing. Having no children of his own, Ain Sama saw the potential in the boy and began to tutor young Naruto in clan politics and etiquette. I see. Hiruzen finally spoke, feeling a sense of pride in his surrogate grandson's actions. The compound really seemed to brighten up whenever Naruto would come over. Every single resident took to him rather quickly. Between his infectious smile, warm personality and of course, his legendary pranks. Demiurge gave a sly smile. Pranks? Renner inquired. Young Naruto Yuzumaki has a rather unusual penchant for setting up elaborate pranks against various victims of the village that has done him wrong. The elder Hokage explained with a slight chuckle. 
I have officially listed them as training exercises as in many cases, they expose weaknesses in our own security. Bubble bath shampoo in the hot springs, exploding confetti hidden within the markets, laxatives in the local bakery and his pinnacle of pranks, painting the Hokage monument bright orange in the middle of the day. The lanky acting clan head listed off a number of the Uzumaki's most infamous pranks. Hearing this, both the fire lord and his daughter gave a small chuckle, as they could only imagine the panic that would ensue after each of these pranks. For his part, Yashiyuki could see how these pranks could be used for practical exercises. Imagining that the bubble bath and laxatives could be replaced with various poisons, the confetti acting as explosives, and the painting of the large monument honoring the past Hokages could be replaced with explosive tags. Which if detonated, could cause untold amount of destruction and death to the village below. However, all that stopped with Ain Sama's passing. Demiurge sighed sadly. While no disrespect to you Hokage-sama, young Naruto saw Ain Sama as a grandfather figure. And as such, he was greatly affected by his passing, turning his attention towards the other residents within the Nazra compound to ensure their care. The solemn atmosphere fell over those in the room, Renner included. Though for different reasons than the rest of the occupants. If what the archdevil had said was true, then Lord Ains had passed away and bestowed his legacy to this boy. Academy. The young overlord was waiting. He had known of the arrival of the fire daimyo and his entourage, as soon as they had entered the village, kind of hard not to with the commotion his unannounced arrival had caused, now it was just a matter of time before he would be summoned. He was prepared though, having already issued his instructions to those necessary to gather at the compound he had purchased not long ago, albeit under another name of course. In an ironic twist, the very compound they had bought was none other than the Uzumaki clan compound, where his parents had once intended to live as a happy family. Of course, the only reason they were able to purchase the property was due to a real estate law that stated abandoned complexes and compounds could be put on the market if they were abandoned for 10 years or more, something the San Dayami had failed to realize when keeping the boy's heritage a secret from everyone. Naruto had his reasons for pursuing the purchase. First and foremost, it was his by birthright, and while the old man may have had good intentions, it left the property open to being bought up by others. Something he couldn't allow. So waiting until the old man deemed he was ready for his inheritance was not an option. As it were, there were other parties already interested in the property that Naruto had dispatched Sibas and a few of the others to convince them to back out. Leaving him to be the sole interested party. Aside from his own personal interest in his parents' compound, it also served as a sort of neutral area for him to invite others that he did not deem trustworthy enough to know of the existence of the Great Tomb of Nazarick, and so far only one had earned his trust to be granted such an honor, Anko Midarashi. Not to mention, the now-named Nazra compound gave them an official presence within the village itself and a more accessible place for the snake mistress to meet him at before they would depart towards the great tomb. The groan of discomfort broke his musing and turned his attention to his fellow classmate and rival friend of sorts, Sasuke Ichiha, whom was tenderly rubbing his abdominal area. The all right? Naruto quietly asked, so as not to gain the ire of the sole instructor. Not that he cared about the scar chunin, but the less attention he garnered the better for the time being. Though with the arrival of the Fire Lord, he was no doubt going to acquire a lot of attention. Yeah. The Ichi had dismissed his rival friend's concern. Something Koss and put in my lunch just isn't agreeing with me is all. It was a clear lie, but the whiskered overlord conceded to the Ichiha's wish and left him be. I see. Came Aruka's voice from the front of the class, prompting both to turn their attention towards the front of the room, seeing a Nico mask Anbu standing next to Aruka. Naruto Uzumaki, I don't know what you did this time, but you've been summoned by Hokage-sama. Hearing this, coupled with the implications that the scarred Chunin had implied, many of the students began to whisper amongst themselves as to what the whiskered blonde could have done to be pulled from class and called before the Hokage. You would do well to remember that there are many reasons one is called before Hokage-sama, Hiroka Yamino. Niko sternly reminded, leveling the man with a glare behind her mask, causing him to tense up on the spot. Not just for disciplinary reasons. Right. The scar Junin stammered in embarrassment due to being called out in front of the entire class. Yuzumaki, get moving. Naruto could only grin as he gathered his sparse belongings and approached the Nico mask Anbu so that she could escort him to the old man's office. A moment later, the two of them were gone in a swirl of leaves. Okage's office. Okage sama, he is here. Nico's voice broke the occupants of the room from their thoughts as she stood to the side to present the whiskered teenage overlord. Renner observed the young blonde with a critical eye as he entered the room, taking of note nearly everything appointed air. First and foremost, she noticed his raw power, despite it being severely restrained, as well as how his outfit resembled that of what Lord Ains would wear, albeit, slimmed down, and not as gaudy as the elder Lick's attire. 
She then drew her attention towards his face, taking note of the three whisker marks that adorned each cheek, making him admittedly cute. His eyes however, well kind and warm at a glance, held back a hint of malicious mischief behind those cerulean spheres. Something she herself found rather appealing. The glint from the sunlight had brought her attention towards the seven rings he wore upon his fingers. Each perfectly sized for his digits, located in the exact same placement Lord Ains had used. This, accompanied by the sheer power the young teen exuded and how he carried himself told her that something big had happened with Lord Ains. While she didn't believe the story that Demiurge weaved, she did know there were bits of truth expertly weaved into it. Lord Ains did appoint this boy to be his heir, for whatever reason, and the residents of Nazareth did respect him, if the tone of the devil's voice was anything to go by. You summoned me, Hokage-sama. Naruto questioned respectfully, foregoing his usual greeting to the elder man due to the company present. Yes, thank you for coming, Naruto-kun. Hiruzen greeted as he took in the sight of the blonde teen for the first time in a few years, as sad as it was to admit, all the while cursing the mortal enemy of all Kage's paperwork. I must admit I am surprised to hear that you were chosen to become the heir of an up-and-coming clan, is there any particular reason you didn't tell me? Well the elderly man hid it well, Naruto could hear the hurt tone in his voice. I apologize for not informing you, Hokage-sama. Naruto started, giving an apologetic look to the old man. But as you know, key figures on the council who hold a lot of influence don't necessarily take kindly to me and would no doubt block or even sabotage any attempt to establish the Nazareth clan if I had gone through the local channels. With a frown, Hiruzen nodded his head. Ever since the boy's status was leaked out 13 years ago, numerous members of the civilian side of the council would call for the boy's execution, banishment and imprisonment, all for the security of the village. It didn't matter how many times he had the problematic civilians removed, others would simply take their place. It had been no secret that Danzo had wanted the boy to train. Though Hiruzen knew full well that by train, the bandaged warhawk would strip the boy of his emotions and everything that made him human and mold the boy into a loyal weapon, only to him. Of course his former teammates, Hamura Mitakado and Kahari Yudatane, more often than not would back Danzo's policies. However, they were little more than pawns in Danzo's game, and Suratobi was sure that once the two no longer proved useful, the warhawk would have them removed. The only side of the council he didn't have a problem with was the Shinobi council, consisting of all the current clan heads. With the exception of the now deceased Fugaku, now replaced with his more level headed widowed wife, the majority of the clan heads were rather neutral towards the boy. While Tsum and Makoto both looked after the boy when they could. Regardless of what the council says, Yashiyuki spoke as he stood up from his chair to turn towards the blonde teen. The request for the establishment of Clan Nazarick has been approved by my courts, so they have no say in the matter. I thank you, Lord Yashiyuki. Naruto replied with a bow. We will still need to announce this to the council. Hiruzen spoke up as he stood up behind his desk, signaling one of his anbu to call a council meeting. However, as Lord Yashiyuki has stated, they will have no say in the matter. Very well, the Yuzumaki nodded. With your permission, your grace, shall we? Yes, it would be best to get this out of the way. The Fire Lord nodded in agreement. And if it would not be too much trouble, could you perhaps give us a tour of your compound after our business with the council has been concluded? Of course, we would be happy to. Demiurge voiced, standing from his own chair and following the fire lord out of the room, towards where the meeting would soon take place, while the others filed out and followed behind, Renner falling in to step alongside the Yuzumaki. Compound? Hiruzen questioned, looking between the black-haired devil and the blonde overlord. Ah yes, in order to prepare we purchased an abandoned compound lot located near the Ichiha district. Demiurge replied with a smile as he saw the realization wash over the elder village leader's face. The H that compound belonged to. He stammered, flickering his gaze towards the blonde Yuzumaki. My parents, yes. Naruto answered with a knowing smile. Well, more so my mother than my father, but all the same. How? How did I know? The Yuzumaki finished the question hanging upon the old man's lips. Well you may have promised my father not to reveal who my parents were until it was determined that I was ready, the furball was under no such obligations. Boy. Urza raged within the teen's mind. Who are you calling a furball you hairless monkey? Sorry Urza-chan. The young overlord mentally replied. But we can't have the old man know what kind of relationship we have just yet. Oh, a relationship, huh? The vixen grinned in a teasing fashion. Not now. Naruto groaned within his mind before turning his attention back to the gaping old man whom had almost stumbled mid-step. We had come to a sort of mutual agreement. The blonde explained, seeing the concerned look on Hiruzen's face. In exchange for giving it access to my senses, that being sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, it would answer any questions I had about my parents as well as give me limited access to its chakra. And when did you make this agreement? 
the elder village leader ventured to ask. About five years ago, shortly before I met Ains Jai Jai. Not a complete lie. Garrison only nodded, feeling a sense of failure on his part to protect the boy, since five years ago would have been that horrible night he had been chased by a mob of drunken civilians and severely beaten, all for something he had no control over. But, the compound would have been yours in a few years by birthright. The Sande Ami shifted the topic. Why spend money to buy it now? I know. The whiskered teen nodded. However, if I had waited, it would have been too late. Did you know that the compound was already on the market to be sold? How? The words got stuck in his throat before he groaned in realization. The Housing Reclamation Act. Indeed. Demiurge nodded. Hence why it was imperative that we moved as quickly as we did. No telling what others would have done with the belongings of Naruto-sama's parents. But the tired sigh, Hiruzen nodded in agreement before turning his attention towards the large wooden doors of the council room. Taking another deep breath to prepare himself for the oncoming headache he turned towards the blonde overlord. Naruto-kun, stay out here until you are called, please. He requested. I'll keep him company, daddy. Renner exclaimed while bouncing on her feet, earning a chuckle from her father. Very well, princess. Yashiyuki stated before turning to his old friend. Shall we? But the final nod, everyone minus Naruto and Renner, entered the already filled council chambers, leaving the two blondes alone. Once the two were alone, Naruto turned towards the girl. You're not just the daimyo's daughter, are you? It was a statement, rather than a question. No, considering your given name of Renner, I can only assume that you are a reincarnation of Renner Therrier Chartalon Ryle Vaisulf, otherwise known as the Golden Princess or your personal favorite, the Witch of the Falling Kingdom. How do you know this? Renner demanded, this was stuff only Lord Ains would know about her and those loyal to him. What did you do to Ains-sama? You are familiar with the events surrounding the night of my birth, yes? Renner nodded in confirmation. Unfortunately, Ains Jai Jai had gotten too close when he came out to investigate what was happened and got trapped in the seal within my, alongside the Kyubi. Naruto sighed. Seeing as there was no escape from the seal, considering it was created by the Shinigami himself, Ains resolved to instruct me to take up his mantle and care for the great tomb of Nazarick. It was three years ago that his time finally came to an end in front of all the floor guardians within Nazarick. He continued as a lone tear fell from his eye. I promised him I would carry on his memory and take care of those within Nazarick. Silence hung between the two for a handful of seconds before the young blonde girl turned and looked Naruto in the eyes. So what is your plan for the future? She asked. My plans. A malicious grin spread across his face. I plan to bring the entire elemental nations under my banner and resurrect the Sorcerer Kingdom, albeit under a different name. I see. Renner grinned, matching his own, which was rather unsettling coming from a nine-year-old girl. Then you will need some political connections. By Lady Renner, I do believe that this will be the start of a lovely partnership. I fully agree, Lord Naruto. She replied, giving the whiskered blonde the same title she referred to Ains by. Shortly after, the doors of the council chambers opened, inviting the two in. Unknown to all present, the establishment of the Nazra clan was just the first of many moves the young Yuzumaki would make to begin his conquest the elemental nations. First to establish his influence within his home village, and now with the partnership of the Fire Lord's daughter, he was guaranteed to have pull within the fire capital itself when the time came. Yes, a new era for the shinobi nations would be ushered in. Either through diplomacy or blood and conquest. It mattered not, all would fall under the banner of Ayan no Tokoku. So this part ends here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, so quickly like this video for second part of this series. And comment down below your thoughts about this series. And now it's time for me to go, bye.